Brandon, you can also let people know if they have trouble getting into the Zoom that they can go on to our YouTube page too because it's actually uh, getting ready to go live on our YouTube as well. Cool. Wow, that's dope. All right. So I got us open on Twitter and in IG right now. And then our stories are going to our Facebook directly. Yeah, if you look at our IG live too? Well, nah, I I, we couldn't figure that part out. Oh. Nah, not yet. We just we just doing uh like random posts and stuff throughout the time. Oh, I got you. Okay. And then hold on, let me see if I can get uh get us rocking and rolling over on. All right. We can't do Facebook. Hey, what yet. what yeah. plaque is that over your right shoulder at the top? <laughs> shoulder? That is a, that that shoulder. Is a, oh, you're talking about Mary? him. Okay. I'm yeah. gonna say that's just a picture, bro. That's Mary. <laughs> that's Mary? Yeah. The top one? With the dude on it. Oh, that one? Oh, yeah, that one. That's future. Future. Okay, that's the one I couldn't see who that was. Yeah, future. All right, you guys are ready to rock and roll? Let's we got do a couple it. more people. I see DJ Jules in there. Nice. What up? Let's rock. All right, let's do it. So listen, I am happy you guys are 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 here and joining joining me for the first edition of Conversations with G. It's, a, it's an idea that we've been kicking around at Killer Boombox for a while, and uh, our brother G Spin has actually shown up and been a part of uh, the live panels that we've done. And you know, with everything that's going on, we wanted to figure out a way to bring some of that energy to the digital space. So when we had the conversation about talking to both of you guys at the same time, I was super excited about that. Cause I know that, I know that Che is probably one of the few people who's got some good stories about G. <laughs> <laughs> Knock it off, everybody got good things. Che and I, I mean, I mean. No, see, know, I didn't I, mean bad like that. I meant no, good, no, like, no, no. Che, like no, good, che, go che. tell them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, Chet, the reality is, is that, you know, through everybody in the music scene that I know, I've known Che the longest out of anybody that I probably deal with on a day-to-day -day basis at this point. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we went to high school together. So it's cause that's when, that's when that relationship started. So it's been, a, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. We know each other for, you know. Ninth grade. Yeah. Before, before good haircuts. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let's 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 start back there. So you know, yeah, it, it's very interesting that two you know <laughs> friends from high school still both ended up in the in the music industry. Like, so how did you guys meet, and how did you kind of develop the friendship? Well, I, I'll start first. Um, G's have the uh, he's definitely one of the main reasons I'm even in the music business. Um, G was already DJing, and I think. I think he was 14 and I was 15 and I bought his hand-me-down spray painted green Technique 1200s. Mm -hmm. I bought, he got, he upgraded, got a new pair. Um, I think he got his from Ant, right? Did you get the new uh, pair from Ant? Might have, yeah, that might have. So that was, was a little later though. I don't know, yeah. was that, that was after high school though, wasn't it? You would nah, come nah. back from Hampton at that point. Was that high school? Yeah, it was high school. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Cause I had him in my room at Deckard. Yeah. Um, so we had this DJ, um, we went to we went to school with these kids, the Ant Brothers. I mean, the Green Brothers. There's three of them, and one of them, the oldest one, was a super nice DJ, like Jazzy Jeff level skill level. Yeah. Was this yeah. out in Brookline? Yeah, Ant Green, DJ Ant Ski, or uh, I think that's what he went by. Yeah, Ant was. Ridiculous. Yeah, and Ant, that's how Ant I was, was like, taught me how to DJ. Yeah, Ant was like Jeff's mentor, mm -hmm. and I used to just watch those two and be like, you know, quietly like. Hating, not hating, but just like, damn, you know, you know, because I didn't have turntables. I didn't have, mm -hmm. you know, my dad's was he had a techniques, but it wasn't a 1200. So it wasn't level. So he couldn't scratch on it or anything. And so Jeff was over there getting nice with it. And I was sitting there like trying to get in the game. You know what I mean? Just like just watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was and that was in high school. And then, you know, fast forward, like, look, I mean, Che and I, Che, he was he was a year older than me. But we played basketball together on the same team. We got in fist fights against each other. We, um, you know, you know, uh, I mean, we we just, I mean, we hung out. And then the crazy part with with Shay was that, you know, he was, you know, he was messing around with DJing, but he wasn't really a D. I wouldn't consider him a DJ in that sense. And then I remember I came home from my college year um, when I went to New Haven, and I, I decided I wasn't going back. And it was that summer and Che came back from his either freshman or sophomore year at Hampton. 
And I had all this producer equipment at my house. And I was I was terrible. I was a terrible producer. Always was. Like I had an SP, I had an MPC, and I could do nothing with it. It was just Where'd you basic. get all the equipment from? You was all just well, you know, you... No, at the time I had started helping out with um uh, T Max. Yeah, right? this, yeah, with T Max and with, with 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 um with Danny. And so Danny had had some equipment, so I was holding it in my house and Okay. Um Those but I never had I, talking about Danny from New Kids on the Block. Yeah. Yeah, and I had um I had no I just I just didn't have the patience to be a producer, man. Like I, I just I I wanted everything to move quick. So my, my beats were terrible. But I say all that to say so Che came by the house one day and again, like I wasn't thinking he was producing anything. He's like, Oh, you got an SP twelve, huh? I was like, Yeah. He was like, Can I mess with it? I'm like, go ahead. And I lie to you not. He grabbed like three or four records and in ten minutes, like he had some Pete Rock, you know, large professor shit coming out of there. And I was like, yo, bro, what have you been doing? You know what I'm saying? Like, what happened? You know what I mean? Because it was be- it was literally better than anything that I had ever personally seen in a span of, like, literally 10 minutes. And I was like, yo, bro, like, what's going on? And so then he kind of, he had told me what had been going on in his life in in, um, in Virginia. Virginia. And yeah. so, yeah, so that was kind of, you know. So know what were you doing in Virginia, Che? Um, you know, I was supposed to be, I was at Hampton. I was supposed to be, you know, going to class and doing all that. But Hampton was a, a real interesting time at Hampton there. Cause you know, this is like out Iverson years and stuff. So when I was a freshman in college, Iverson was a junior in high school. So this is like Iverson years. This is the Neptunes coming of age, Timberland, you know, all these people, Teddy Riley had moved down there and set up shop. So there was a lot of music around and a lot of people doing stuff. And um, we had actually had a, we had a friend of ours who went to high school with us who was a year older than me named T.O. Lee, who was a, um, a bass player. Um, so he had a lot of music gear too. So when I got to Hampton, you know, like all delusional kids who think they can do anything, because in hip hop, you know, when you start hip hop, you think you can break dance, you think you can DJ, you think you can rap. So the first thing I did is I thought I could rap. And so- of course. And my first mistake was thinking that T.O. could make beats. So <laughs> I started, T.O. had all this equipment. So I go to this guy, T.O., and remember, I, the key word there is he's a bass player. So everything he did sounded like Cameo. Yeah, still does. Still does. <laughs> yeah, so I was trying to, you know, I was looking for some Primo-like beats, and he gave me some Cameo beats, and I sounded he's terrible. You, he's hitting you with She's Strange. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm sounding like Coogee Rap on the records, and everyone's saying you sound like a bad Will Smith. So I was like, all right, no more rapping for me. But I realized I was like, you know what? I could be nicer. I could do, I could use this gear better than he could. So I actually started um, basically using other people's gear. And I talked the, we had a studio, we had a music department at Hampton, they had a studio. So I convinced the, the head of the music department to let me have it, to let me have access to it. And he was like, well, why should I let you have access to it? You know, you're a business major. And I was like, I bet you I can use the studio better than anybody you got in the music department. So he gave me, he like auditioned me in the studio and I knew the studio better than anybody else. So he let me have access to it. So, and after yeah. that, you know, I could go in the studio anytime I wanted. Okay, so this was, so this is when you guys were both uh, now you're both in college, yeah. right? So, so that means okay. So you guys went to high school. That means you knew G during the microphone thunder days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Good oh. God, yeah. That was my first rap group, microphone yeah. thunder. We, we, EXP. You know, we rode everywhere together. You know, like so when yeah. we would go out, we always hung out. We'd go together. Yeah. We go. We go to the, the you know the park where we play ball was near his house. So we'd yep. be at his, you know at his house. You know we all were cool with his pops. His pops was a cool pops. You know the sportcaster pop so he knew everybody my pops was real cool so we had like the cool pops like we had a friend of ours Quam, who had a, whose pops was an architect who was kind of corny like so g's pops was like the sports pops everyone called my pops cool trey because he sounded like he sounded like a jazz late night dj you yeah know? My dad's for sure. he always spoke yes. in like a dj voice so everyone yeah, so, so we, we would always hang out together yep where were, so as you're both, you know, you're, you're home, G, you're coming back from college, you came over and started messing around on this equipment, where did you guys go from there? Because I know you're, you were still DJing, and then where did right. you going? So what happened, well, what happened for me was at that point, um, I, I decided I wasn't going back to school, 
Um, and really, man, that's that's when the whole like Middle East grind kind of started in terms of you know the venue in Boston. And so, you know, that's really when I kind of got hooked into more of the what one would call the underground hip hop scene in Boston. So Acrobatic, Mr. Liz, 7L, and Esoteric. That's when Pete was doing all of the um, uh, DIF productions, was doing all the mm-hmm. events at the Middle East. And so I was like the house DJ for that. And that's when we put together the Newberry Freestyle Sessions and I was working with T-Mac. So that's really when I started to really kind of just concentrating more on um, just DJing for like underground clubs and stuff. And um, and then that moved in. And I was doing some of the traditional Boston nightclubs at that point. Like I had started doing um, Access on Tuesday nights. Um, like Axis, Armand, Van, yeah, um, yeah, Armand wow. Van Helden was doing the house room. I was doing access upstairs on Tuesdays, and um, yep, with we used the to come when I was in town. I come yeah. up and we go to yeah, access. Yeah, so I, that's when I kind of just started on on that scene a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, I know what Che was. Che was still at college, and I think that's really where he started. Really, you know, started building his relationships and 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 all of that stuff in in terms of the whole Hampton thing, right? Yeah, I um. I had personally, a was it KG first? Well, KG was my homie first, but my first deal right, was actually right. with Teddy. Um, yeah. so I had a friend of mine, Rick, who's actually from Boston as well. But Rick used to dabble in the pharmaceutical trade. and um, But the one thing about people that dabble in the pharmaceutical trade, they know everybody. So uh, Rick knew um, Markel, which is Teddy's brother, and some of the other people that worked the Future Studio. So Rick was the one who really kind of introduced me to Teddy. And um, and then I basically kind of had a, like an, you know, kind of audition with Teddy in terms of playing him some music. And then Teddy offered me a deal. So that was really how I got on. But at the same time, I had befriended KG from Naughty by Nature. So KG was a good mentor. I was cool with Q-Tip. I was cool with Lord Finesse. I had um, another pharmaceutical friend, if you will, from New York, who was cool with Diddy. And he was cool with what uh, he was from the Bronx, though, originally. So even though he was cool with Diddy, he was real cool with Fat Joe and Lord Finesse and Showbiz from Showbiz A&G. So I'm kind of meeting all these people right around the same time frame. And this is it's now and just to kind of frame it a little bit time wise for Teddy. Is this around like um, this 94? is four? Yeah, yeah this, one, this one he did. Yeah, this one he did the Rex and Effects record. Around yeah, there, when he's 93, 94, Black Street, um, you know what I mean? Black Street's in effect. He's still okay. dabbling with Guy, though, because I was cool with Aaron Hall from Guy was around. So they were talking about potentially a Guy reunion, but this is real Guy time. I was cool with Levi and Dave Hollister from Guy and Chauncey. And, this, so and, and around Neptune's that are time. around this time, too? Neptune's are Neptunes, around. Yeah, around but, that time. You, know, you, you remember, Pharrell wrote Rump Shaker. So yeah. Rump Shaker was even before that. Okay. So Pharrell was, you know, at this point, Pharrell was about to be NSX Pharrell. So Pharrell was rolling around, pulling up in the NSX, you know, that from that rump shaker check. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I know and, like, and, I'm like, who is this kid, young kid? I think he had just graduated high school. I knew him um, from the music store because I, I, for about a month I worked at a music store because I didn't um, have any gear. So I worked at a music store for about a month so I could get the discount. Mm-hmm. And from there I met Chad. I met Chad in... Um, and um, their boy Kenna, who was also part of like the Neptune Click. So I met Chad and Kenna first, and then I met Pharrell. Yeah. So now, for you, when when you're working with Teddy, are you working on on production with him? Are you playing for him? Like, what, yeah, what's no, kind of your role with him? You're, you're still doing your stuff independently. Like the way with with, with Teddy, you know, you put you off in the studio or wherever we were at. We went to Trinidad for a while too. We went to Trinidad for like six months recording. But you know, you'd have your own setup. And you just do what you do. You still produce, you know, tracks, and then you give them to Teddy. You know, it was um, it was a great. I I feel like I owe a lot to Teddy because he taught me the difference from making beats to a, a being a you know what a song was. You know, what I mean, I'd say before I met Teddy, I just made beats. You know, I'd make cool loops. <laughs> you know, Teddy taught me what the difference between a beat maker and a song maker is, and a, and a producer is, and kind of stepping up into that next space of being a producer. Yep. And that really prepared me for phase two of my, you know, really when my career started, which is really with Wyclef. Okay. So I know that you, while, so while you're doing that, I know, G, you're running around, you're doing, like, you're doing radio. a production, you're doing no, well, the radio, that, well, but radio. I know you jump. you got ready to jump to the radio. 
Well, but I know that I know you. This is how you can. Isn't this around the time you connected with, connected with Kareem, right? Yeah. So crazy, and and just timing wise, and how kind of Che and I, mm-hmm. our worlds kind of connected, is um, I you know the underground thing was cool, man. But I was I was broke, broke. You know what I mean? Like it's you know hundred hundred bucks here, hundred bucks there. It's, it's not you know. We're like, getting hundred bucks. Nice. Well, if <laughs> right, exactly. Um, but it was you know it was tough, man. So you know you you had to work your day job and then hopefully get lucky and have a gig at night. And I almost threw the towel in. Um, but then you know King B, Kareem, Kareem Ali, that that I know a lot of you know. Um, I had started doing a couple little parties with him. We had this one, um, I think Sugar Shack was around that time and a couple of things, but nothing was really happening, man. So I was almost ready to just be like, you know what, man, this, I'm going to sell my gear and records and move on, excuse me. And um, and so we ended up finding, um, actually my wife's friend, she was a bartender at this place, I think called uh, Road Trip. And she was like, yo, the owner's that brand new. It. Yeah, Road Trip. And um he's like pretty much you should meet him he's pretty much down to do anything so we went down there and we met this guy down it was a it was this little corner restaurant uh down by the boston garden it was called road trip and we were like all right he gave us friday nights and we could do whatever we want with it so we were going to do like a soul kitchen uh friday nights and that's what it was like soul kitchen fridays at road trip um and that's what it was for, you know, and there was, you know, you were probably one of the first people there, you know what I mean? It was like literally went from like 10 people to 20. It's the typical story. And uh, we grinded it out. And then probably about a month in, all of a sudden it was like, wow, there's like 200 people in this, you know, pretty small capacity room. And then fast forward, that party ended up being Cosmopolitan on Friday nights, which I'd like to think it's probably still one of the greatest Friday night parties that Ooh. Boston ever saw for the urban. I got in a lot of sure. trouble in that club. Yeah, and 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 well, and here's here's the funny thing. So yes, yeah, so I was I got I got offered a jamming gig through that because Melissa, who was at the Mirror and Pebble show at the time, she used to frequent it, and I think she told Roy, and Roy had hit me up and said, "Hey, would you be interested in in um, doing a mix show?" And then it kind of grew from there. Yeah, um, but the funny part is even but even before that though. Um, or like right around the same time and just kind of fast forwards Che's career a little bit because obviously he had a lot between what he just told you with meeting Wyclef to what a fast forward was but Che ended up at some point being I think SVP of a and Warner right? Yeah that's like so 99. Che, right so it's right so it was right around the same time I got on at Jammin and Che gave me my first a and gig. Che he was SVP of a and Warner and I ended up getting like a regional uh, it was like a scouting gig, but it was an a yeah, like a regional, gig. regional scout. Yeah, and so yeah. I was doing that, and I had actually found a couple of things that they signed, and um, that's really when that's when the jamming piece really like took off, like right after that, and I, I had to stop doing the, the Warner thing. But yeah, so that's that's kind of how it transformed in that. It was, you know, I met you know Kareem and I decided to do something. This Friday night party really became something special, and then that also turned into, you know, we had Saturday night at. Um, what was that in Somerville? Night games or something? Night yeah. games. Night, ga- night games, yeah. So it was like we... I got in you know, trouble in there too. Had, yeah, so I mean, it was really like, you know, and I was doing all the, you know, whether or not it was either me or it was Chubb that were doing all the, like, basketball player, football player parties, and you know, that came to town. It was one of us, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, my profile built up, and that's when I started at Jammin. But you got to take a step back. So you undersold yep. that. So the road trip thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you that story from the from the consumer side. Mm-hmm. So you know me, we know Kareem through Stace, and because mm-hmm. Stace and I went to school together. So yep. Kareem used to be like at UMass Boston's campus all the time, and he just, you know, we all just started to rock with him, and he was doing um street of street promotion for loud at the time. Yeah. So he's telling us about this new party he's about to launch or whatever. And cool, okay, let's go. It's Kareem. He always puts us on the good stuff. I know it's going to be some fine ass girls there. Mm-hmm. We're going. And you're right. We were amongst that 10 that came. And I remember when you launched the party, he said that, I want to say that he said there was nothing before, like no no music after like 95 or not, whatever the time. Yeah, like, it was, it was, was, some, all, it was, all, it was some arbitrary it was all classic, number. Yeah, it was all classic based. So again, it was that kind of soul kitchen vibe. It was all throwbacks. And we stayed with that format for a the while, first month. Like probably, yeah, well, a little bit longer than that. Like we, st- we stuck with it for a little while and then, you know, 
the party became so big that really the first half of the night would be that and then i'd open it up to more current based um stuff yep. and so then yeah and then it just kind of became just this party but so yeah the first, i mean so the first night we go he's like yo man you gotta come and you know we're young the first question we ask is who's djing we see the yeah. name on the flyer g spin we're not familiar but yeah. fucking cream said it we going right so yeah. we come around and the way this club was built when you walked in the door there was a bar to your right there was a mm-hmm. the bar sticks out a little bit and behind that, where it stuck out was where they put you DJing. Yep. Tuck, so when you walk away. in, a, exactly. So you walk in a club, it's like a shoebox. You look straight mm-hmm. to the back where the cigar bar was, and we yep. can't see you. So we mm-hmm. come in, me and all my dread friends, and we come around the corner and we see this little white this white dude sitting sit behind the turntables. And Kareem was like, and Kareem was telling us it's gonna be classic soul, R and B classic. So we come around, we're ready to party. You come around the corner, we're like, yo, Kareem, who is that? Mm-hmm. Like, nah, trust me, B. He's ill. You are gonna trust me? You, it's gonna be dope. I'm like, all right, man. And then we came back each week, and we're like, every every week we were prepared to get you out of here. We were prepared to give you the, yeah. you know, what I'm saying, give you the sand, man. But you kept rocking. And then That's around it. that time, what was the club? The club keep um, making me prove myself now. Exactly, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. And I knew then, that he was on. Oh yeah, and then I'll tell you what it is that took the club over the top. The club that was on on Friday nights, um, the one out in uh, Randolph. Oh yeah, yeah, we took their whole crowd, Vincent. Yeah, they they shut them. down for something happened and they, they shut, shut down. down. And when they shut yeah. down, y'all were the we place to be. All. So every ball player, yeah. I remember seeing. Like all the Patriots, everything every I've ever Patriots, seen. Yeah, anybody and everybody that was a that yeah. was a was a player came yeah. into that little small club, jam packed. Yeah. Every girl, and then like I said, I'm a broke college student, so I'm loving it because I'm breezing by the line, all that yeah. going straight in. And you know who? And you remember who was was um, holding the door down at the time? Um, Patrice, Kenny, on oh, Patrice. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, he went Patrice from there, he, and, and I remember Patrice. He he did it for a while, and that was that was after he was at the gallery. Yeah, and nah, Patrice mm-hmm. was my man. Yeah, and then he ended up going to New York, to, and that's when he started kicking in with the comedy. Yep. Okay. Sure. Yes, yes, Stephanie, you're old as hell, just like all of us. <laughs> <laughs> she said, "Wow, this makes me feel old." Oh, Shout yeah. out to everybody that's joined us. Our room is getting filled in. I see a lot of cool people in here. Good folks that have been been supporting yeah, all of us. Thanks, yeah, yeah Stephanie, went, Stephanie went to high school with us too. Yeah, high Stephanie went to high school with us. Tanks Lee yeah. uh, one of the one of the artists that's in um my temperature check stuff. Really, really. Oh, he had a fire R and B record the other day, yeah, like two fired. days ago, right? Yeah, like yesterday. Yeah, he's in here. Good. I see my man Malcolm Gray in here. I see Tim Larue. Tim Larue is a cat you should definitely check out because he's he's working with a lot of the key artists that are in the yeah, scene. Yeah, that's Tim's manager, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tim's Tim, my Tim, homie. Yeah, Tim, 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 what Tim, up? Tim, Tim's family. Tim been to my crib. Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, Tim Anderson's been to my crib. Okay, and my brother Dre Robinson's in here. Sounds yeah. right. So yeah, I'm sorry. We had to tell that story because I just I remember us in our skepticism when we came around the corner. I remember y'all cir- circling the booth trying to get it's me like, out. He's like, word. <laughs> we turned around and looked at Kareem. And mind you, if you anybody who didn't know Kareem, Kareem was, you know. Like six foot three, dread, dreads down to his down to his waist. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And usually, shut the, up, run his mouth for days. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So I'm thinking, I'm like, yo, this dude ain't got us. In, what is? I don't know what he's got us into, but hopefully this is going to turn out all right. We so yeah. So while this place. while this dude is <laughs> growing his DJ career, what do you? You're down in in. in um, is this around the time you start with uh, Y Club? I started with White Cleft around '96. Um, I moved from I moved from VA to to New York. Um, my girl was already in New York, so um, I had an aunt that lived in Jersey. Was coincidentally, my aunt lived across the street from KG's house, um, but I knew KG before that. So um, just because of the close proximity of KG's house and my aunt, I felt like that was a good base. So I actually moved to Jersey first, and I got an apartment in Jersey. But my girl lived in Brooklyn. And the same same girl that I had from high from I mean from college, so we dated in Hampton and we were already you know real real tight. So her place was in Brooklyn, 
And except for going to KG's place, I really didn't like Jersey like that. I would be at KG's and then the rest of the time I'd be in Brooklyn. So I feel like I got more acclimated to New York with Brooklyn. So, and then you, you know, you naturally have your relationships from kind of where you spend your time at. And um, we won't get into the story, but I was on probation. <laughs> and um, probation required me to have a job. So when I got to New York, um, because I knew so much about the studios and the studio equipment and all the gear and stuff, I just naturally went to a music store. So my first week in the music store, Wyclef comes in. And at this point, remember, I know a bunch of people already. I know KG, who's Jersey, Booger Basement's around the corner from KG spot. I know RZA, I know Q-Tip, I know, um, I know Diddy, I know all these people. So it's like, even though I'm working at this music store, I'm actually already really connected with a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I tell Clef I got beats, you know, whatever. He's like, yeah, right. You know, like, you know how many people I meet that tell me they got beats? And I'm like, nah, I really do. And I, and I was like, you know, I was ready. So I had, I had the joint right there and I was like, here, take it. So he was like, nah, we in a music store. You got speakers, play it. So I played it. He was like, oh shit. He was like, <laughs> he was like all right. So he said, what you doing? I said, well, what you doing? I was like, the only reason I work here is I was like, I'm on probation. So he was like, so you just need a, you need a job, like in words. So you got something to turn in. I said, yeah. He said, all right, well, I'm, I'll hire you. And I, I moved, I started working with refugee camp. Um, so I worked at the music store for two and a half weeks. Just, just enough time to meet White Club. Yeah, just enough time to meet Clef. And then, um, you know, he gave me a job, like, you know, because I had to have that, like, job title where I, I had a paycheck and I had a thing. So it had to be some structure to it, which 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 I actually think helped because I think working with them, if I didn't have that and I didn't have that need, who knows what would have, Clef would have had me there working for months without paying me, who knows what would have happened. So that really helped the situation that I had to have a structure and a job. Well, I want to take a step back for a second because, I, you know, both of you guys coming from the Boston area, I wanted to talk about influences, you know, in terms of, you know, what were the influences for you and what you were starting to do with your beats? And also, G, for you as a DJ, who were the people that you were like, yo, that's the benchmark of what I'm trying to do when I rock a party? Because I think, yeah. and, and you're, I say that you're unique, G, in that you were in this underground world but at the same time, you were understanding the, the dynamics of what it took to actually rock a party. And those yeah. are two very, those things can actually help each other if it's done correctly. So if you guys could tell me kind of some of the, the, the G, you go some first. Of those. Yeah, I mean, mine's real easy. I mean, I think as far as my influences, early influences, obviously, Ant Green, who was my mentor. I mean, literally, I was 14 years old. He had already graduated uh, high school and he was like, look, you know, he was looking at me like, yeah, whatever, kid. He's like, all right, you want to learn how to DJ? He said, you got to come to my house every mm -hmm. Saturday and I'll show you. And I was like, cool, no problem. And, and, key, right? and key point there, where's his house? Well, correct. <laughs> Ant didn't just live in the Academy of Homes. He lived in like one of those basement apartments in the Academy of Homes. So I had to go to, so those of you who don't know, Academy of Homes is a pretty serious project in Boston. I had to he do was that. was in the hood, hood. <laughs> Literally, yeah, yeah. At, my at, one at experience the, at the, in the at Academy of Homes, they tried to steal our bikes. Right, right, right. And so I had to used to go to the academies and learn how to DJ. So obviously Ant was, you know, huge influence on my life. And then as far as listening to like radio, man, like I remember listening like Wallace T who was on WRVB uh, 104.9, um, DJ, DJ Eminem, uh, Jess McKee, wow. um, just kind of like some of those early DJs I remember kind of listening to and were like, man, they're dope. Um, but, but really in terms of my party rocking, um, who I really is still my one of my mentors today, and I and I really kind of bit so many routines off of was Clark Kent, because Clark used to come and do the this club in Boston called the Hub Club on Wednesday yeah. nights. There was a hip hop party on Wednesday nights called the Hub Club, and Clark would come up from New York. And what I loved about Clark was, you know, all the New York DJs really at that time were all mic guys, so like. Kid Capri and you know Doo Wop and you know even Chubb you know like mm -hmm. they just they were masters at like controlling the crowd with the mic and that really wasn't my thing I didn't feel comfortable doing it um it, it just you know whether or not I, you know I didn't 
I didn't have the lingo. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't, I couldn't excite the crowd like they could. Like that was never gonna happen. But what mm-hmm. I loved about Clark was like Clark really told stories through his records, um, and the way he set them up and and put them together. And I and I really used to just study him and watch him. And and really that's kind of how I learned how to rock parties. And I never touched the mic. Like it, at Cosmo, I was never on the mic. I really didn't get really even remotely comfortable on the mic until really later on in my radio career and almost to the point in the clubs until I really I came to New York in 08 like that's when I felt a little bit more comfortable because you had to a little bit but that was never my thing you know I remember when you got you started getting nice with it at the radio though because I was like you remember that time I came to visit you at the radio yeah you were like all right hold on real quick and you 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 mute it and he would do his radio thing and he was he had it down he just well it was but it was always like like, oh shit who's this dude (laughs) <laughs> it, it was always listen it was easier for me kind of just doing it in a studio like I was in my basement in the, for in a sense and not really thinking about the fact that x amount of you know thousands of people are listening to you as you know it was it was just easy to me like I kind of came natural now if you put me it was never easy to me if you put me in a club with a bunch of people really getting completely comfortable I got better as time went on but that definitely wasn't my strength so really Clark was really the one that kind of showed me how to put records together, not even realizing he was showing me, but th- those were my influences for sure. It's interesting that you say that, that the fact that you weren't on the mic so much, because yeah. you weren't on the mic, that actually is part of how you won crowds over, because some so. guys were good at being on the mic, and some guys were doing great, bad imitations of people who were good at being on the mic. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, and I just knew yeah. that it wasn't a strength of mine. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just knew that that wasn't going to be a uh, you know, that wasn't going to be the way that I was going to win people over. I just had to play great music and I had to play it in a way that they enjoyed it. You know, that was really, I let the music do the talking for itself, really. Pat Gamir, what up? Shout out to Pat Gamir, G's brother in the building. Yep. Um, um, For me, it's pretty simple. I was pretty one dimensional at that point. Um, I grew up, my grandmother's street was a street called Monroe Street. And my grandmother's good friend was Judge Elam. And Ah. Judge Elam... (laughs) Is Guru's father. Yeah. And so that was my grandmother's good friend. So I was always a massive Gangstar fan. And if you're a Gangstar fan, you can't help but be a Primo fan. So I studied Primo. Primo was everything. When I was home and when I when I literally would make beats, I had a little picture. I'd have no posters or none of that shit in my house. I had a picture of Primo above my SP. So that was literally my sole influence for making hip-hop that was my sole reference i didn't really want to you know i know don't get me wrong dre was amazing at this point there were all these other talented producers i just fixated on on one because he he to me was the pinnacle of where i wanted to go i wanted to figure out what my sound was but it was it was definitely through the lens and filter of what primo had already was already doing you know what i mean i had met the digging in the crates guys, so which was great because that was like being in the gym with the OGs. You know, they were just more advanced. So you're getting in there with Showbiz, who's like a uh, an encyclopedia of records and samples, and they got all M&D. produced too. Yeah, all yeah. of them, and all of them are nice. So you're talking about Show Showbiz who was nice at it. Buckwild was nice at it. Diamond D was nice mm-hmm. at it. So it's like you're around all these dudes, and they're all beast. So. And, and, and for me to be comfortable in that environment, I had to be a beast. You know what I mean? I had to be nice with it. And so arguably I was nicer on any of the gear than any of them because I also, I think I would go a little further. I actually read manuals and I would actually study and ask questions. So I think part of being hip hop was like being so beastly with yourself, you wouldn't be, you know, you were too cool to school. So, but for me, like when I was around Bob Power, who's Q-Tips engineer, I'd ask him everything in the world. You know what I mean? I would ask so many questions. He'd be like, who is this kid? You know, asking about compressors and all this stuff. So I know for a fact, I feel like, and that's no knock to any other producer, but I know I started learning about these other things real early where I started being super nice in the studio and could cut tape and EQ at the board. And I knew I knew the in, in and out of an SSL, in and out of a Neve, and I knew all this equipment. And I started knowing, noticing that when the other producers saw that, they were like, oh shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know all the, you know how to use that? You know how to use that? You know how to use this? And, and that started being my advantage, you know, is my information. But Primo was definitely my, the one I studied. 
So it's, it's interesting because you guys just, you know, Che, I think you were in a very similar position to G in that you were starting to be in the music industry and you were, you know, understanding how to make hit records and, you know, radio kind of stuff. But at the same time, you had the underground aesthetic, the same thing that he was doing with the DJing. What, did you ever find yourself in a position where you were you were torn between the two of them or did you like, it sounds, it sounds like your heart is, is definitely into the, the Primo records, but you've had some monster I think, records. I think going into the big records, it just, that was just, that was just, that was just God, to be honest with you. You know what I mean? I think I didn't have a, a commercial sound or anything else. I only had the sound that I had, you know, which was rooted in like, we were talking about records, uh, G, G uh, we did this thing on Instagram where we posted our 10, like our 10 favorite records or that influence or whatever. And Criminal Minded like sonically changed something for me. Like when I heard Criminal Minded musically, it changed something. So I, I feel like I was forever on this Criminal Minded primo wavelength. So anytime I make music, it was always from that, you know, from that lens. So I don't realize, I think I was just fortunate to work with these big artists and these talented artists and I think God put me in those rooms and gave me those opportunities. And that's how the records became big records. But I still made, you know, what you might consider underground music. You know what I mean? Mm. Like if you took Zion and you gave that beat to most Def, that might have been a backpacker record. You know what I mean? But it just mm. so happened that that record ended up being on Lauryn Hill and being whatever, you know, Ghetto Superstar. I mean, I used the sample that Black Rob used on another record later on in life that became a Black Rob record and with some raw hip hop shit, but because it was on prize with Maya singing the hook, it became this commercial, you know, record, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, so during this time, you guys are kind of moving up at the same time. I know, G, you eventually get into the programming side of things. Che, che was moving faster than I was. <laughs> <laughs> his, so his, I was checks were, his, che's checks were bigger than mine. So that was one of the things I was going to ask you. So how are you guys keeping in touch during that time? Are you, you guys are talking on a frequent basis, I'm sure. Yeah. He hadn't I, moved to New York yet. You weren't. No, no, no. This, no, I didn't move to New York still, until 08. Yeah. Yeah. He was still okay. really moving and shaking in Boston and he was coming to New York a lot. Yeah. A lot. I was saying, I was living, I was living, I stayed, I was stayed on your couch many, many nights. Yeah. He was coming to yeah, New York yeah. a lot. So we would yeah. see each other a lot. I was in the studio a lot. He'd come through. You know, he, he's the one, he got, he, shit, he's, he got a Lauren cassette I don't even have anymore, you know, the Miss Education album. I do, you know I, I mean? do. Like, he was, he was around. I got, I got, I got Sony, I got Sony Dats, too, from Y, from, uh, yeah, from Y, y Club, Club when you get, yeah, yeah, when you so get G was Club around, stuff. G was coming through the yeah. studio, so I don't really feel yeah. like there was this big separation, you know what I mean, even though he was in Boston, he was around a lot, you know, yeah. so, mm. I and we'd link like up when Shay came home too. Yeah, he'd come through and pull up to the spots or whatever and see, you know, see us yeah, when he I came come home. Yeah, I'd come to Boston, we'd hang out. So yeah. it, was, it was still like we was connected during this whole time, you know. Yeah. And then eventually he moved to New York. So even then, actually, when he moved to New York, I was already he in went LA. To LA. Yeah. But we were still, you know, at that point, we have, you know, we're both solid, you know, solid in the industry at that point. Mm -hmm. G, it's one of the things you talk about G moving to New York. So G gave me the first interview with the breakfast club um remember the that very, the oh absolute God. very first i totally interview. forgot about that I totally no i remember i remember 20, that 2010 right yeah, yeah like before they had just started kind of during the testing phase before the the official debut yeah. debut and i got the interview yeah. i will tell you how your man did me dirty i was looking for the exclusive about how he how he Theo Epstein the whole situation. He's like, all right, Greg, we gotta go. I gotta, I gotta get off early. You try to cut me off, man. We started talking yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. His, his thought process behind that. And I, I, you know, we started talking about Boston. And one of the things that I've kind of I have a theory that we're not the big flashy person in the room when it comes to the music industry. We're the hardworking person that's doing the groundwork. Like we're the and the fact that you yeah. said, Che, that you, you know, one of the reasons you excelled is because you sat down and started reading the manuals and getting into that, you know, and even G with you, you were, you were taking that extra step to learn how those things work behind the scenes, how the, how the radio thing worked as well. You know, yeah, we I mean, that's, I had no choice. I mean, I, I was just going to say, I mean, kind of to, to that same point is, 
is that when I started at Jammin', man, I mean, I was doing, I was doing a one hour mix show or, and then what ended up being two hour mix show for, you know, year and a half, two years for free. Like I just, I just liked hearing it when I got out the club at two in the morning and you know what I mean? And the and only reason you- that I, I've, well, the thing, the reason why I ended up it kind of to Jay's point of kind of just being in the right, right place at the right time and kind of being ready to kind of jump on opportunities is that I was learning and I was watching, uh, I mean, first it was Baltazar, but then it became Romero really quick and just seeing how they ran the board and, I, and I'd ask questions and stuff. And then when um, there was a show in Boston, it was called Lyrically Boston with that Clinton was doing with the five footer. And that was on mm-hmm. Sunday nights at 11 o'clock. And Clinton had moved over to um, BOT, over to 977. And they asked me, they said, do you want to do, do you want to do this local Boston hip hop show? And I was like, yeah, I'll definitely be down to do it. I was like, but I'd like to switch it up. And they were like, well, what do you mean? I was like, well, you know, and, it's, and I'm somebody who grew up as Che did, and, as, and, and maybe you did, Greg, although you're a little younger than us, that it grew up on like Lecco's Lemma, right? So that was always in my yeah, mind. I was, and, that was in my Yeah, so I love I love Magnus and, and Lecco's Lemma, but I always thought that it was, I never thought it was fair to Boston artists and kind of just the culture in general to kind of just throw everything together in a half hour block or, or an hour block of all Boston music. I was like, well, why don't I take the best of the Boston stuff that I get every week and mix it with the best of the national stuff? And so exactly. that it kind of stands up, stands up next to it. And they were like, yeah, sure, go ahead. And so that's what started the launch pad. And that was in 2002 or three, maybe 2002, I think February. And, um, mm-hmm. and then that was just an hour show. And then that ended up being a two hour show. And then that led to me getting comfortable on the mic, learning how to run the board and, you know, being able to multitask. And then when nights opened up and I was able to become the night job. Mm-hmm. So in the midnight, so yeah, so it was, it's figuring out kind of the steps while you're kind of the, yeah, you know, and the, I think the, there's an the, important the, thing the I want to add to this. Me and Jeff, neither of us finished college. You know what I mean? So we okay. had to be dope. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I just feel like no choice. <laughs> yeah, this is like we, this is like this was the plan. So we had to be dope. You know what I mean? Like, so when these opportunities presented themselves, we were ready. You know what I mean? Because we both we both went went on a leap of faith with with our dreams, so to speak, if you will. You know what I mean? So I think it required yeah. extra work. Sure. But do you think that having that kind of, you know, team first background, willing to play a uh, uh, not as flashy a role um, mentality, do you think that has, you know, worked against you in any way? Nope. That's the opposite for me, I think. I mean, look, in terms of, and I know Che might look at this a little bit different, and he actually probably should. Um, and that's just me looking out for my boy because I don't feel like he's gotten nearly the amount of credit he should have um, absolutely not for a lot of big records. But but I say that to say I, I think it's one it's one of the biggest mistakes I think I see a lot of um, personalities make today, especially with the, the emergence of social media. Um, it, it, you can really I posted something about this the other day because I've seen just so much of it. It's like you can get really caught up in your own ego in terms of some of the fake love or real love that you may get off of social media. And I think until you really kind of play the background a little bit and kind of observe and see what people in front of you have done right and what they've done wrong and you making your own mistakes and realize, all right, I was stupid. I shouldn't have done it that way. I should have done it this way. There's just too many people out there trying to be loud without really putting in the work to get loud. You know what I mean? And it's been really important to me. It's like, I try to be as quiet as possible until I really have something going and then I'll, you know, then I'll talk about it and then I'll be excited about it and I'll, you know, try to promote it in the best way that I can. But until you're really, you know, it, it, you, you got to build it first, you know what I mean? And, and be humble with it. And then, you know, I think good things come to you, you know? I think people get messed up and they don't realize the, the importance of being loud and good. You know, yeah, you're going to be mean, loud and good. We have a lot of every, loud and everybody's people. Gonna have, and everybody's going to have time to be loud. But, but again, like, if, you, um, if you're if you not putting in the work, man, listen, like, even through social media, I think people are getting more keen and, and hip to it. Like, people can see through bullshit. At least, you know, smart people can. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, I think, I think you know what's real and what's not. You know what I mean? Like, you know, throwing your demo tape that you know is not ready in my DMs, like, Come on, man. Like that's not that's not putting in the work. You know, make me notice you. You know what I mean? Um, but that's a whole other thing. But I'll let Che answer that question because 
I have uh, thoughts about him. <laughs> yeah, my, um, my, my, my experience with it is different. So when I came into the game, you know, remember I told you I was on probation. So I was just happy to be in the game. And I, per I approached it with a certain level of humil humility, which was very important to me because I was just so thankful to be doing this and, and so on and so forth. So my first company, but my production company was called Invisible Society because I had this theory like, I love the fact that you could just be in the studio tucked away somewhere make this music and then this music goes out to the world. And then I, I forget what year it was, but it was early on. It might've been around while we were making the Lauren album. I'm in with Pharrell one day in New York and he goes, he goes, Che, you gotta market yourself. He goes, you gotta like, you gotta brand yourself. You gotta market yourself. You gotta get publicists, this and that. And I was like adamantly against it. And, and if you see, you know, you've seen what the Neptunes have done and you've seen what their career, and that doesn't mean that they haven't made great music, but they were, he was a, a fantastic marketer. You know what I mean? And so I don't have any regrets over my career. Like, you know, you know, my journey, I'm, I'm thankful for what everything that, you know, has transpired in my career and the journey that I've been on. But if I would have went back and did something differently, I would have invested in myself and I would have invested in a publicist. I would have invested in, shouting about the victories, you know what I mean? And, and not being so humble about it or quiet about it. You know, I would have sued Lauren Hill. You know, and people people are like, do you regret not suing Lauren Hill? And it's it was just about, you and James, it was just you and James that didn't, right? It, it, it was, it was just me project. and James that didn't sue. The new art guys sued and they got paid. Right. Um the, basically the way Lauren's album was it was two crews of guys. These new art guys that Lauren grew yeah, up please work this down. Yeah, there, there was um the new art guys, which is Veda Nobles and a couple of guys that were signed to him. And then those are the guys that sued. And then me and James Poison, and we were the outliers. James thought about suing her and then changed his mind. And I think the only reason we didn't sue her is we thought we were gonna be able to figure this out with her because we were so close with her. She was like, we were almost like- And it was, like, and it was her first album. You figured she'd be, she'd be a legacy artist, right? I mean, yeah, it was her first, stuff with her. Her first right. artist. We talked about like, hey, we're gonna fix all this moving forward she was like a sister to us you know what i mean it was like your sister stealing from you so you're like you know what we're gonna figure this out so we didn't sue her it was more of a spiritual thing that we didn't sue her why people go go back and ask why would i have what why would i have sued her later um if i had it to do again only because of business move because it's about good business you know what i mean and it's about at that point in time and knowing what i know about business now i would i would do everything with good business you know but, and then I also would have marketed, you know what I mean? I would have hired a publicist to, to, to talk about everything that I did on the album, every last snare, every last breath, anything that I did on that album, I would have screamed from a mountaintop. Well, listen, before we move on, let's talk about the risk. Like, Cause G, I, I agree with you that I think that, you know, I think one of the biggest problems and one of the reasons I was super excited about talking to both you guys today, um, one of the biggest problems is that we have a lot of the new generation, especially in the Boston area, who don't necessarily know the history that's kind of gone before them. And, and not to take any the sale or credit, the, the, uh, the wind out of anybody's sale or the credit away from them, but part of it is I would want people to know they're from a winning tradition. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. one of the reasons the Patriots win all the time is because everybody knows the Patriots win all the time. So when you so if you're from Boston and you know that fly shit comes from here, like groundbreaking, genre changing type shit comes from here, you don't right. necessarily feel like it's an impossibility. So, you know, right. for for you, Shay, let's talk about the that Lauren Hill album. Like, you know, in your career as a whole, like you've been in the spot with a with, where the heat is at all the time. So let's start, let's start with the Lauren album. Like um, where, where are you on? Lauren, Lauren was, you know, like I said, God places you, you know, in the, you know, you know, um, for those, you know, I don't know how people, you know, I'm not here to talk about religion or anything like that, but you know, and I know some people, like I have a cousin who's an atheist. There's certain things you just can't explain, right? So I, you know, I always believe that there's a higher power working with us. Um, and am I muted? Can you guys hear me? No, I no, can hear got you. you. Oh, okay. You're good. Um, I always believed there's a higher power. And so in my case, yeah. I ended up working with this Wyclef guy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, I, you know, my first placement was what Wyclef on his, on the Carnival album. But, what really, but really the Wyclef thing was really, 
all about me meeting Lauren Hill. You know what I mean? Like I did some records with Wyclef and that started off my career, you know, No, 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 Ghetto Superstar to all the girls on the carnival. And these were great records gone to November remix. But it was really forming a friendship with Lauren Hill. You know what I mean? They came out of it because obviously they were group members. They had their flirtation thing, which didn't, you know, and they were at the end of their affair or whatever you want to call it. They were at the end of that. And so Lauren and me became friends. And then, you know, so it was God that placed, you know, that opportunity with me where one day she called me and was like, hey, let's go make some records together. I was like, all right, I'm with it. She was, knew I wasn't happy with some of the cleft stuff because she knew the business was funny with it. But she was like, which is funny, ironic, right? But <laughs> later on, like, you know, it's mm. done again. But she, you know, she called me over. And the first thing we did together was um, A Rose is a Rose for Aretha Franklin. That was the first record. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So That's the one that. that had Elise Neal in the video. Yeah. That was the first record. I remember together. that. We did that in her attic in um, Jersey. It um, was the first, you know. And, and, and then, you know, I think that led into, you know, we worked so good together and we communicated so well. Um, Vader and these guys were like guys, you know, guys she knew from the neighborhood she grew up with. And I think, you know, she had a certain level of, you know, of knowing them, but, and no, and no knock to those guys. But I, I, I feel like me and James were just special. Like, I feel like me and James just had our skill, our, our, our skill set was just a different thing. You know what I mean? And I, you know, and that's my own cockiness and my own thing, because I just know what I brought to the table and I know what happened with the records and I know what's happened with the records for the rest of my career. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, I think- and You guys um, were the foundation of that album. Like you said, Zion, like what are the other, the joints that you did? I mean, let's let's talk about it. Right? I don't remember. I'm not great with titles because I'm just not a title person, but I know doo-wop obviously, um, uh, the joint with Mary on it. Um, the D'Angelo joint, um, you know, the D'Angelo joint, that's just, that's just James sitting at a Rhodes and then me, and then mm -hmm. me taking what James did and making a record out of it. You know what I mean? Um, and that's a lot, how a lot, of, you know, everything was organic, man. She, when, when she, we started the record, she said, I like three things. I like reggae music. I like soul music and I like Wu-Tang go to work, you know? And I mean, you know, and the rest of just. <laughs> those are some you know. ill marching orders. Like, you know, <laughs> those are the yeah. illest marching orders. But she was dope because just she was so open minded. You know what I mean? Like you could just try shit with her and you could just sit there and you'd come in and you could just play her shit. And she would be like, you know, she wasn't one, you know, later in life, obviously I worked with a lot of different artists, you know what I mean? And you had artists that you'd play them something, they immediately shoot it down. They wouldn't even like explore it or whatever, you know what I mean? And some of that exploration is how we arrived at some of the, the most amazing records because she was willing to explore what this could be. You know what I mean, and um, and that's what was so great about her. But yeah. I mean, you you just named the records that were really the ones that everybody is super excited and always remember and talk about from that yeah. album. You know what yeah, I mean? You know, so X Factor, I, X Factor was one of my favorite records from that. You know what I mean? Um, I did I did like which I did not do this record, but this was one of my favorite records from the one. Uh, what's the record with uh? You might win some, but you just lost. No, not not X Factor. Lost ones. Lost ones. Lost ones. Yeah. I like that joint too, though. I didn't do that one though. So, at, you know, things go south with you and Lauren. And this is why I love to hear this talk because, pe like I said, there's more people that need to know that, you know, we have somebody from our D from our DNA, from around our way, that that has got championship rings, yeah. you know? Chase, rings. Chase, Chase, from, Chase from the gut of around the way. Right? Exactly. Yeah, hum Humboldt and Decker Street. I'm about to say he's from the he, like I said he's from really around the way. Che used to run the liquor store down Dudley. Yeah, look, yeah, Which on one? Humble and Dudley. Yeah, yep, oh, Dudley wow. liquors, and they had Dudley liquors right across the street from Nubian Ocean. <laughs> wow. Yep. Yeah. Really. So yes. Really... So we like I said that championship feel. You know, G. I gotta give. Listen, I gotta give you props. I I when G was when G moved to power. My nickname for him was Theo Epstein. And I like, I would always go on social media. I was like, every time something happened at power, I'd be like, yo, Theo pulled, young Theo pulled another one. And only he and I would know what I was talking about. Yeah, but shout out to Theo. G, exactly. Was, so G Theo was like, a freshman when I was like a, a senior. He was the only freshman that I used to ever talk to because he knew sports so well. Wow. I didn't talk yeah. to freshmen. I was definitely yeah. a freshman snob. If you, I didn't talk to a little freshman. What was, 
What's the kid that used to talk so much trash that was a freshman? Remember that kid? Seth something or other. No, no, the, um, no, no. The black kid. Remember Chris? Like, he was, oh, Christian. Christian Lewis. Christian, yeah. Yeah. Christian always was trying to beat somebody up or get somebody beat yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so just like you had, had just like you got those rings, G, you got a couple of those too. Like, you know, yep. you came in and you came into the number one market in terms of music in America yeah. and, you know, well, we're a part of that leadership structure and putting, you know, and what is still, together. yeah, exactly. And what is, and, and put together what is one of the, the strongest brands in radio, in, 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 in our world I'd, right now. I'd say, well, I mean, two together. Both. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, so how that happened was Cadillac, who was a program director at um, Jammin, um, he had made me the um, music director at, 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 at Jammin at the time. And I'd been the music director probably for, I don't know, about at least a year, year and a half. And we were in a, we were in a good groove. Ratings were amazing. Um, and Cadillac had had some opportunities to go to New York. He had, they had offered him Hot 97 years ago. And um, they had, I don't know if they had offered him Power before, but he had the opportunity to go to Power. Um, and this was coming off of the, there was the star debacle with Envy and it just, power was a mess. Um, and so they asked Cadillac if he wanted to go do it. And then he went and he took the job and about three or four months, I think into him being there, he kind of just loosely, uh, and he was still working with, with Jam at the time. He had come back and he kind of just threw it out to me randomly. He was just like, Hey, if I could get you to New York, you know, would you go? And I was like, well, that's a big ask. Um, I just had my, my first daughter at the time. Uh, when my daughter was, I think Bella was, uh, she was like three, something like that. And, um, and I was like, well, I was like, yeah, and I was like, I, 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 I could, I was like, but I gotta have the discussion. We gotta figure it out. It's a big move. He's like, yeah, 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 just let me know. Fast forward. He comes to me, he says, Hey, like, what would it take to get you there? So I literally, I sent him a note. I was like, you know, this is what I make now. This is, you know, plus the, you know, 40% that it would cost to live in New York. And, you know, so I put together a number and kind of just the things I would need, corporate housing. I need a lot of things to get settled. And I sent it to him. And I remember him just being like, yeah, I don't know <laughs> if that's going to happen. I'm like, and I was cool with it. Like I was, mm -hmm. I, you know, I was a little disappointed, but I understood. You know what I mean? Like I definitely shot for, for the, no, not ridiculous, but I, but I, it was a, I, I gave him a real number. You know what I mean? And I was like, look, I just, I'm moving my family. Like this isn't just like, mm -hmm. I'm coming down. And you were MD um, at you were MD at Jammin at this time, right? I was I was still at Jammin. I was doing well, you know what I mean. I was happy, and yeah. um, and I and I knew what was going on in New York, and I the only one that I knew at Power at the time was um, Deja because she was actually doing middays for us in, in at Jammin from New York, and then obviously yeah, I, I knew her. Clue, and I and I knew Clue obviously, and um, and I just knew there was a lot of weirdness going on there. So, but anyway, fast forward, Cadillac came back two weeks later. He was like, "Look, man, I got all this approved. What's up?" And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. So then I had another conversation and then, and then I did it. And then I just went and, um, and I remember the day that I got there, man, like, um, I, you know, there, there was nothing loaded in the system. I just had to just kind of really jump in the, the seat and just go. Um, and then as far as kind of how we transformed it was, it was, you know, Ed was, Ed was doing our morning show and I, I think Steph Lover was doing PM drive at the time. And Cherry was, I didn't yeah. know Cherry, Cherry, Cherry Martinez was doing, um, she was doing the late night show and obviously I knew Cherry from Boston. Um, and then there was just like a lot of people that were kind of just going through the motions, man. And, and I, um, you know, they just, they, I, I don't know if a lot of them kind of had just, you know, they, a lot of those people had really had like some real highlights in, 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 in the scene. And I think they just had kind of been through it, man. And, and, you know, Hot 97 was, you know, beating them pretty well. And, you know, Flex was on there yapping nonstop. And you know, they just were beat up, man. And it was, um so we kind of really had to, you know, methodically kind of just change some pieces in and out. And, um you know, the first person I hired was, was DJ Self. Um, literally, I had corporate housing in Jersey City, and I would literally go to the clubs every night just to see who was playing. And Self was doing. And he Self was at that point. He was any any party that was moving, he was doing. So I was like, I got to figure out a way to get this guy back on the air because he had been on power at one point, but didn't get along with the PD that was there. So I got Self on. 
And then he kind of brought the union with him. And then I brought pro style up from Orlando. Um, and then we realized, you know, we, we needed move. to make a change. <laughs> yeah. I mean, pros, pro, but I, what I always loved about pro was, man, his work ethic was just phenomenal. And then actually, before I even get to the breakfast club, uh, envy, literally the day that I got there, he was like, yo, you got to get me out of here. He hated it at Hot 97. He just, he, he was miserable. But the problem was for me is that if you remember, Star and Buck Wild had been on power. They had gone at Envy. There was the big lawsuit. Envy ended up suing Clear Channel at the time and got a big mm-hmm. payment. So, you know, I'm like, Envy, I'm like, you want to come over to power? I'm like, you just sued these people for X amount of dollars. I was like, bro, it's the... Anyway, long story short, and you're like, I'm good, up, but I'm not that damn yeah, good yet. <laughs> right, right, but we ended up, it ended up working out, man. And so Envy came over. Uh, he came over and did was doing afternoon. So Envy was in the building. I had tried to hire Angela. She was one of the first people I tried to hire. She was on Sirius with Cipher, um, Cipher Sounds in the morning on um, Shade Forty Five, and I always mm-hmm. loved her. Um, and then Cypher had, had taken on a, a bigger role at Hot. So I, him and Rosenberg, I think, were doing that like pre-show. They were kind of warming up their show. And so Angela had done, was doing mornings on her own. So I wanted her to do just weekends. I didn't want to bring her over. So I went to Paul Rosenberg because I felt it was the right thing to do. And I said, Paul, I said, hey, I really like Angela. I was like, can she do weekends for us? And I know Paul was like, yeah, I mean, you know, she can. He was like, but, you know, you can't, you just got to make sure, you know, you, you have to literally, like, con- contract that you're not going to put her on in the mornings. I'm like, Paul, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, I can't do that. And he was like, nah, you can't have her. So I'm like, shit. So didn't get Angela. Fast forward about, probably about a year later, Envy's doing great in the afternoons. And I get a call from... I think it was Joey, Joey Manda, Joey IE, who's over at Interscope now. And he said, hey, would you, um, or it might have been Jay Grant. It was one of the two, but would you sit down with Charlemagne? He had just got let go in Philly. And I was like, yeah. I was like, I don't have anything for him. I was like, but I'll sit with him. And so I went, sat, had lunch with Charlemagne and his manager at the time, Kevin Hunter, who was uh, Wendy Williams' husband. And we had this little sushi spot across the street. And I said, hey, listen, I said, we're not. You know, we're not looking to make any changes right now. I was like, but, you know, I've been a fan of, you know, what you do. Obviously, you're, you know, you're a lightning rod. But what I got through the conversation with him was is that he was a super radio nerd. And he and he knew about radio and he cared about radio and he knew the ins and outs. And he knew how kind of it wasn't just kind of just this, the, the personality that we see or saw for at the time. And I was like, oh, man, I'm really digging this guy. I was like, but his manager, I was like, I'm never working with this guy. Like, I just got a bad feeling from the start. So. Charlemagne and, my, Charlemagne and I circled back later on that day and he's like, you know, I said, hey man, great to come there. I was like, but I'm just going to be honest with you. I was like, I don't think I could ever work with that guy, Kevin Hunter, in my life. So if he's still your manager, that's probably going to be a problem down the road um, because I just don't, you know, he's very like, you know, we, we don't deal with managers. We deal with the personality. I mean, he was somebody, he was like, no, nah, no, nah, I get it completely. Um, and then, you know, we got, we got to the point with Ed that we just, we, we had to make a change. We needed, we needed something. And so, um, right around that same time, Charlemagne hit me. He said, Hey, you know, Kevin's no longer my manager. Um, I said, great. I, uh, Angela had hit me. She was getting ready to take a job in Philly at, um, I think hot 107.9. I told her not to get on the train. I said, do not get on that Acela. I said, we're putting something together. Just, I need you to be patient. Please be patient. She was patient. And so we had Charlemagne and we had Angela and then we did not have envy because envy did not want to do it. Um, he had been on with Miss Jones on Hot 97 through the whole, whole mm. tsunami thing, and he was like, "I'm not going to be held responsible for something that either Charlemagne or Angela says." Blah blah blah. And so we we made a couple of you know adjustments in his contract, and we ended up putting it together. And you know we probably went through 10 million names. You know I don't remember who exactly came up with the Breakfast Club, and we were just like, I mean, whatever. It's such a generic name. I mean it. It sounds, I guess, great now, but at the time we were kind of like, yeah, all right, well, we got to name it something. And there was already a breakfast club in San Francisco. Um, it was like a pop thing, but that was it. And we launched them on a Saturday afternoon, and snowy. It was a snowy day, and we launched them on Saturday because we kind of just wanted to test it out, and it was terrible. And um, and it was bad for like, I mean, you know, I mean, we a lot of people were angry with us that we got rid of Ed, um, you know, and that was, you know, for me, I mean, that was. 
that was that was one of the worst days you know as far as being on radio having to get get rid of you know arguably one of the greatest you know media personalities in hip-hop you know what i mean like without ed i certainly probably wouldn't be doing what i'm doing um and then they just you know and what the the key to the breakfast club and i tell people this all the time is that they were so far ahead of the game um envy and Char- charlemagne and angela Mm -hmm. um on social media they 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 were using it already they were early adapters on twitter uh, and i really was just twitter then and they and we posted everything to youtube every interview so you'd only hear you know 12 minute clips of the whole interview but then you go and you see an hour interview on youtube and so they almost really became the first urban podcast and i think that's really what helped them because their ratings were terrible for a long time in new york and their first then, year, they um, were, their first year, they were real bad. Uh, it was, yeah, it was bad. They couldn't, they couldn't find their groove. Like you know, everybody was talking on top of each other. Part of the problem was Angela was kind of one of the fellas. I mean, shit, she had managed Wu Tang Clan. Like she, she held the same mental thoughts that we did as far as music goes, right? So we kind of had to get her to be a little bit more of a strong feminine woman on the show to kind of go back and forth to Charlemagne and Envy. Kind of had to be more of the point guard and kind of throw it back and forth, and then. You know, a couple things happened. The Ray J interview for sure really exploded them on the national scene. Um, and they just, you know, it really just caught fire, man. And it's amazing, like, what it's become, you know. Mm-hmm. I, you know, and, not, and not, just, not just the show. I mean, I'm just proud of all of them. You know, I think they've all kind of adapted. Charlemagne obviously has grown into being something um, a lot more mature. Not, not as many of those got you moments. He doesn't really have to do that anymore. Um, I mean, dude, he's got two New York Times bestsellers, crazy. Angela, you know, Envy's got his property thing. So, yeah, I'm just super proud of them and, and what they've become. And then you fast forward to the, the Angie Martinez piece. You know, I you know, I know you used to say it like that. I, honestly, I had nothing to do with that outside of literally I had said something to one of our mutual friends like, hey, what's the deal with her contract? And then the next thing I knew, two weeks before it was done, Thea Mitchum, who was the PD and, and EVP of programming, pulled me in her office and said, hey, Angie's coming to power. And I said, Angie who? And she was like, <laughs> You was like, Angie Stone? <laughs> I, no, I didn't. <laughs> be Angie B? I, I was like, you have to fucking be kidding. Um, and that was it. You know, but there was other ones. I mean, shit, we almost had Flex. But we, we were probably a week away from getting Flex to come. Um, oh. You know, there's a lot of those stories. So and you yeah. had a couple, con- you had a couple conversations with Sife too, didn't you? So- yeah, I mean, Cipher was the first. Cipher was the first one, I, person I tried to hire. Cipher, I tried to give. I wanted Cipher to do. Um, I was trying to pull Cipher from High 97. I wanted I, Cipher and I have been friends forever. I mean, if you're in Boston, you know Cipher used to DJ my birthday parties. I was trying to get Cipher to do PM Drive, um, but he he wouldn't leave. He was Cipher was Hot 97 to the core, and you know, I think. I mean, he certainly figured it out, but, you know, you can't really be overly um, loyal to any one of these companies. Um, You can have loyalty, you know what I mean? You can feel really good about it. And I'm super, super proud of the time that I had at Jam and and at Power. Like, you know, and I love those people. But, you know, there was a time when I was considering going to hot. I had an opportunity or conversations. Wouldn't necessarily say opportunity. But, you know, you got to keep your options open, man. You got to see what people are talking about. So, yeah, that's my radio run. You know, I, we're talking about that. I had, there's one thing that just really kind of occurred to me. What was it like for you, G, to be in the club and be playing one of your boys' records that you like? You know, that was and you know it was going to oh, tear no, the club up it. when you was getting no, ready to drop no. it. Well, for Che, the first one was. Um, I needed to make it was the Destiny. Right? No, it was no, it was no, 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 I no, think. no, no. It was Destiny Child remix. I think that was the first one that I had on wax where I looked on the back and I think they gave you they credited you wrong, right? They say yeah. Che Green. Yeah, or something like that. Yep. Yeah. And um, I remember I remember playing that in the club and they're just like, boom, shh, boom. And I was like, yeah, my man, my, my boy did that record. You know, <laughs> um, there was that one. Um, There's a couple of others, too. But that's the one that stands out. Like, that was the first one that, like, resonated with me. I was like, OK. Yeah, I had that Gone in November one that used to play a little bit. Yeah, oh, the Gone in November remix, right, with R. Kelly, too. That's right. Kelly, um, yeah, that was hey, was that one first. No, the. No, no, no. Destiny's no, Child no, was no, first, first, right? Yeah. 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 And that was the other one. That, and that was right That was right around the same time. Yeah. And if you think about it, if you remember to all the girls from his album, I, I, I realized I was on to something with these bass lines. And like, yeah. mm. so all the girls is what started it. 
Like I, I, you know, to all the girls came from this cool in the gang record, if I'm not mistaken. And it, it was this baseline. And I was like, oh, you know what? I'm on to something with, with the, what's going on in the world musically with these bass lines. So I did, you know, I flipped it again to Destiny Child and that was, you know, no, 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 you know what I mean? And then to all the girls, same thing. I flipped the bass line and that became that remix. And all three of them went platinum. So I was like, wait, something about the bass lines, baby. Yeah. But Che, you, you were going platinum, but you were also keeping a real low profile. Was And you know, you talked about how you wish you had kind of elevated, but I would imagine that there was a piece of that not having to deal with like the that tug of of I guess of notoriety, what is you the know, there must have the, been some good things about that as well. The, the pros and the cons of it. I mean, I'm a pretty low key person, and I and I think my personality is such. That's the only problem, though, because I'm such a low key personality. So when your personality is that, and then you don't market yourself, it's like a it's like a double negative. You know what I'm saying? You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So had you know I so the. I mean, I guess the pro of it is, is that, you know, you just, you just still can just move, you know, just move freely. You know what I mean? You really just, you don't have, you know, obviously as people like Timberland and Primo, you know, they had a lot of, you know, they had a lot of people run up on them and different stuff and, you know, everybody wants something from them and, you know, and, but, you know, that's what comes with the territory. Um, I, I wouldn't have been, I'd have been all right with it. I, I think, growth is everything, right? You learn, you grow, you know what I mean? I think my growth ended up being being an executive. You know, I, I was a producer, but the way I was able to grow from my experiences was like, okay, let me learn from the inside too. Let me learn this record company. I know the studio, now let me learn the business. You well, know? tell me a little bit of, about that transition. Like you, you're making these records, you, you're, you, like you say, you're doing platinum records, you're doing that level of business. How are you making that transition over? Like you, um, G talked earlier about you um, getting in an A and R position, and we know eventually you end up with that position with with good music, and then being in charge Warner of the whole shebang. I actually started with Warner in '99. Mm -hmm. Tell us about mm -hmm. that executive trip, that that road. Well, you know, one of the things for after the Lauren album, I realized that I really need to learn more. I knew a lot. You know, I really focused on my craft. So at that point, I was like, you know what? I really need to learn this business and I need to know as much about this business as possible so that, you know, you can never be in a position to be taken advantage of again. So um, that led to me being, and that simultaneously was around the time my daughter was born. So my daughter was born in 99 and I took the job in Warner at 99. So I, I also think it was about the maturity of, of getting married having a family. I got married in 99. I had a daughter in 99. So I think it was like, okay, I want to, I, I needed to level up, if you will, business-wise with in conjunction with having a family and, and, and all that. So that's what that came from. It was really about, I needed to grow, you know what I mean? It, with, with my knowledge as a person, as a business person. So that's where that came from. So then let's, let's talk about that. Like you, so you're, you're still producing all along the time that you're you're in L, those executive roles as well. You we you know we kind of left off on your side of the story with you um, and the whole thing with Lauren. From there, if I remember correctly, was to Dre next, right? Well, Dre came a little later, so I did the okay. I did the, I did sorry. the Warner thing. I did that was like 99, 2001, 99 to two thousand one. Um, at the end of two thousand one, right around two thousand two, I um, scored a movie. I scored this movie called White Boys. Um, uh, Danny, damn, Danny Hawk was the lead Hulk, character. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Danny Hawk was the lead character of it. And, and that was just a luck, lucky thing. Like, you know, the director mm -hmm. knew some of the music I had done. You know, someone at, you know, he approached me about doing a score. I, didn't, I had no idea how to do a score. I was like, sure, yeah, I know how to do it. You know, I did, I, you know, so I scored this nice. movie, White Boys, and it really opened up some interest in that thing so I um I showed up on Hans Zimmer's doorstep I, I I bought myself a ticket to California I found out where his office was and I flew there and showed up on his doorstep and he took me in so I worked with Hans Zimmer for two years um same thing like Jake with like G did Hans I, I lived in I had bought a house in Atlanta so me and my family had moved from New York to Atlanta but Hans and company put me up in corporate housing 
So I ended up bringing my family to LA and we lived in corporate housing. We had a brand new house that we had just bought in Atlanta. My -hmm. son was born in Atlanta. So my son was still a baby and we moved to um, California and we lived in corporate housing and I never lived in Atlanta again. Guys, I got to change my headset. I'll be right back. Yeah, All right, I no worked, problem. Yeah, I yep. worked with Hans for two years. Um, great learning experience. Worked on a lot of projects, a lot of movies. I still did what I did. I wouldn't say I ever really trained to be this classical score guy. I still was, you know, primarily a hip hop and urban music producer. And I would do a lot of additional production on, on songs and commercials and everything. So I did a ton, a ton, a ton of stuff. And I learned so much while I was at, um, at w- working with Hans. It was great. And then Hans and his partner got in a huge lawsuit. So that kind of affected the business flow of what was going on with Hans. Mm-hmm. And I had a, um, I, I ended up getting introduced to Dre by Mike City and Tuff that used to be in Channel Live. They were good friends of mine. Mike City that did uh, Sunshine Anderson and did the Carl Thomas. Um, you said Channel Live, Mad Ism Channel Live? Yeah, cha- yeah Channel Live. Okay, Mad okay. Ism. And his name's Tuff. Tuff is still one of my really good friends, Tuff Morgan. He's from Jersey, but he lives out here in L.A. He's still one of my really close friends to this day. Um, we still do a lot of business. He's a, he's a publisher now, big publisher, as a matter of fact. Um, he runs the uh, urban music at Peer Music at Publishing. Um, but Mike City and, and Tuff took me to an aftermath Christmas party. And that's where I met Dre. Okay. They introduced him. They introduced me. They said... Um, they were like, Dre, you need to know this guy. He's been working with Hans Zimmer, but he's really a nice, he's really nice on the beats and production. And then, you know, they told him I'm one of the guys from Lauren Hill's album and other stuff. And he was like, you know, Dre's kind of like the Dre is just a good dude, but he's like, you know, he's never impressed. You know what I mean? Like it takes a lot to impress Dre. So Dre was like, yeah, whatever, like nice to meet you, kind of thing. Like, whatever. Like, come by the studio though. You seem like a cool dude. Like, you know, come by the studio next week. So I was like, all right. I came by the studio, played him some beats. He liked them. I'd say every time I stopped by a studio, he picked a beat. And when he and with Dre is when he picked a beat, when he heard one he liked, he would stop you there. So like you might have a beat tape of 10 beats, but if he heard one he liked, he would stop you there and be like, all right, give me that one. And that would be kind of it for the day. You know what I mean? You drop, you give him that you beat, you go home or whatever. Because a lot of times I didn't have the disc with me or whatever. I would have to send the files or drop the files off next time I came. Mm -hmm. So I did that maybe for about three or four weeks. And then he offered me a producer deal. And then the first deal was just an aftermath producer deal. Just be kind of like one of the producers on the team. He had different producers signed to him. DJ Khalil, uh, who's one of the dope ones. But And then maybe after, maybe about a month later, he invited me to be on his personal production team, which was him and Mike Elizondo at the time and sometimes Scott Storch. So Scott Storch was in and out, but the team at that point, he had a previous team that had kind of moved on and he had it was primarily him and Elizondo. So Elizondo was the one who did in the club with him, you know, and did some of that stuff. So I joined that team, that iteration of it. So Storch was in there sometimes. And then I had a guy who I worked with really closely in New York named Mark Batson. Mark Batson had done Indy Iree and Anthony Hamilton. I had actually introduced Mark and Anthony Hamilton. So that's where that came from. And so Mark was still in New York, but I was still, I was like, Mark, you gotta come out to Cali and come and get some of this Cali money with me. So I brought brought Mark in. So Mark, so I came in with Dre and then I brought Mark in. And then I bought this other young guy from Rhode Island in too, um, Dewan, Dewan Parker, who came in a little later. So I brought some of my guys with me. And then I I worked with Dre. In terms of in terms of that era, like let's let's educate a couple of folks. I love this talk. Let let's. What are some of the records that you were working on with Dre? What, are, what tell them some of when the I got joints there, that you were bringing was, off. He was just doing the game album. Apparently, Game had been an artist who had signed for a while, but it, like mm-hmm. everyone knows, you could you could be signed to Aftermath, but that don't mean your record's coming out. So the way it worked with Aftermath is you could sign the, you could sign to Dre, but until he was excited about till you did a record that he got excited about, he mm-hmm. wasn't ready to move forward and like literally work with you himself. So Game was someone who had signed, I think um, D-Mac had brought Game through. So D-Mac, who used to be real tight with Diddy, uh, Game was D-Mac's artist. So D-Mac okay. had brought uh, Game to Dre. Dre uh, Game got the deal. 
Game is working with a bunch of different producers, trying to get, you know, trying to get Dre excited like everyone's trying to do. And then he worked with Kanye. And then Game did this work, the, uh, the girls record, the girls, whatever, you know, girls record that he did with Kanye. And that was the record that got Dre's attention. What was that? Wouldn't go far, right? Wouldn't yeah, go girls far, would get, girl. wouldn't go far. Girl, yeah. girls. With all the video girls in it. Yeah. yeah. So that was the record that got Dre's attention. And then so I, when I started working with Dre, Dre had just started working on the game album himself. So the timing, the opportunity was great. We walked in, and, you know, it's like, wow, he's doing 50 albums, he's doing M albums, and he's doing game. And so I'm coming in, it's right on game's first album. So it was you know, game's first album, and, and, they're, and they're starting 52nd album? Yeah, we were 52nd album, game's first album, Buster Rhymes was, had just signed there. Um, he actually was in talks with Eve, that never really transpired, but Eve was in talks then, so I was around when they did that Eve record, the um, one that that uh, the Storch did. Let me blow your mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, so it was just a great time to be working with him because it was so much. You know, that's when Dre was still active. You know what I mean? Dre was still working. We were like doing five to seven beats a day. You know what I mean? We were really working, and it was it was exciting. You know what I mean? So. And then you know that record came. I you know I did hire me me and Mark were we we were part of doing hire. That really came from um, the way the way it worked with Dre. You know, it's four people in a room, so it's like it's like all trying to you're all trying to make jumpers at the same time. You uh -huh. know what I mean? And somebody's jumper might hit first, and then that would be the idea that would get started, and then everyone would dive in on the idea. You know, um, I think Mike and Mark being natural musicians, if you will, prodigy level musicians. Mark, uh, Mike was like a prodigy level on the bass. Mark was like a prodigy level on the keys. So the way that I competed in that space with those guys, I was nice with the chops. I was nice with the beats. I was nice with the drums. I was nice with the chops and the samples. So I had to get in there fast with my ideas, you know? But was it a situation where where you were like lead, leading, laying, I'm sorry, laying the foundation with some of your tracks and then they were building around it sometimes? It was a free for all, to be honest with you. Honestly, mm -hmm. like he'd open up, Dre would open up the drum machine. You know, Dre was the center of the room. I sat on the right side of Dre, Mark Batson sat to the right of me, Mike Elizondo sat to the left of Dre. And it would be all okay. four of us. And then Dre's engineer would be in front of us. Dre would turn on the speakers, he might sit at the MP, he might start a drum beat, or he might be like, who got some ideas? Obviously, the musicians, they would jump on their, you know, their, their subsequent, we all had rigs. They would, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Sometimes I would pre-prep. Um, and pre-prep would give me an advantage sometimes because if I pre-prepped, I'd already have something. So when I hit play, it might already be, you know, so when I hit higher, for it's instance, true. it already might be like, eh, eh, and then Dre would be like, what the fuck is that? All right, let's go. You know what I mean? And so it was, it, but it was a free-for-all. And then, you know, the best idea would win and that would be the one everyone would jump on. And then we would try to see it through to a finished beat and then go on to the next one mm -hmm. for eight years. I was going to say, so that was, that was a lot of records. So that a eight good chunk crazy. of that, a good chunk of that, 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 uh, that game album. So like hate it or love it, right. Was one of well, you got to remember hate it or love it came through cool and Dre. But what we, what the thing about what Dre did is Dre leveled up everybody's beat. Because Dre had a certain quality level that we know everybody necessarily couldn't reach that that level. So what Dre would do is he would take everybody's beat and work on it. So Hate It or Love It was completely re you know the sample recreated. You know what I mean? When not the beat was already fire when it came from Cool and Dre, but Dre had a certain level that you know you know most of us didn't have the resources of Dre. You know what I mean? To do something to that to take these records to that level. You know what I mean? Dre, you know, you talk about a, a guy with a budget, you know, unlimited budget, you know. So every record on Game's album, if Dre didn't produce it, Dre leveled it up. So it sounds so like he got, was just building on, building on top of that. Yeah, building so we got to work on, yeah, somebody just said wasn't hated or love it a 50 record. It was a 50 record first, I believe. The beat was. Yeah, and then, listen, but everybody. A few of them were. Higher was a 50 record, too, because 50 wrote the hook on Higher. So the yeah, a lot of those, a lot of those fifty records ended up on that game album. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. fifty. You know, at the time, you remember fifty was going to be, 
I mean, game was going to be part of G unit. That was kind of Dre broke breaking yeah. bread. Uh, game was going to be G unit West. That was a way to get 50 to help with some of the writing. And as we know, 50 was really great with choruses and record concepts. So, you know, that sick vendetta, that, that, you know, that's all 50, you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. you know, game was a rapper. Game was a rapper, you know, he had bars for days, but 50 was 50. And 50 was, if you think about it right then, that's when 50 was on fire. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you could walk in the studio and hear a beat and have something to it, you'd be like, God damn. Like, <laughs> 10 minutes and he's already in the booth with a hook and you're like shit what the hell you know when i heard that west side connection that was one of the first records that dre played me that he had worked on on the game shit and i heard that shit i was like what the fuck is this so when he asked me to sign something or you want to come down work with me i was like what do i sign <laughs> that was literally one of the first records he played me so for both of you and both of your roles like you guys have have understand the importance of kind of getting to that higher level of quality. Like, what are some of the things that you try to do like in your respective spaces as a, as a DJ and then even in the radio programming side of things, G and, and Che for you as well with your production, what are the things that you try to look for to kind of make sure that you're at that extra level when you're doing it? What are the things that you're like, okay, how can I just make this great? Um, I think for me, and can you guys hear me okay now? I changed my Yeah, so. I can hear you. Good. Um, you know, for me, man, I, I just do a lot. I pay attention to a lot of what's going on around me in the radio world. Um, you know, I, today it's obviously, it's, obvi it's, it's way different today than when I started. I mean, sadly, in that sense is that, you know, I would love to bring along like great new young talent. Um, Cause I've always felt like that was my strength is kind of finding the diamonds in the rust and kind of helping them become good radio personalities. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with that nowadays is, is that you can't break them in the same way that you did 20 years ago. Or like when I started, like I learned how to be a good on air personality DJ by being on the air from two to five in the morning doing overnights. Well, none of those, none of those shifts are live anymore. Those are all recorded. Right. And it's, and it's different. It's, you can't, so that's a frustrating part of it. But what I look to do as far as kind of like keeping me kind of in the loop and knowing what's going on is, you know, I listen, man. I listen to Howard. I listen to, I still, you know, I'll pop in and listen to Hot 97 and Power and things that happen on the terrestrial side. I'll listen to some of the LA stations sometimes. Um, you know, in my new role over at Sirius, um, I'm, I'm obviously listening to a lot of the different, not just urban stations like The Heat and, and Rock the Bells and, but I'm listening to, uh, you know, the, the the rock stations and the, the pop stations. So it's for me, it's really just sonics and hearing and seeing what people are doing and hearing what sounds like a good break or a good production piece. Um, and, and, you know, and I'll tell you, like when I had left um, Power in 2017 and I went to the agency side because uh, I went to United Talent Agency for a year and a half. Um, I, I needed the break from radio. I, I, I had no more passion for it at that point. I, I you know, I, I miss, I miss doing a real, like since I'd been in New York, I hadn't really done a real live air shift um, in a while. I mean, I was getting on the air and doing some stuff with Angie for a while. Cause I was kind of in between helping produce her show for a little bit, but you know, I missed the actual talking and having listeners call in and having that interaction and just being live and in the element and I wasn't getting that anymore and it was really just becoming um you know just monotonous and so I left and I and I had gone there for a year and a half and it was just you know UTA was it was fine it just wasn't my fit and then I'd went and I consulted for a little while and worked um I was actually working with Timberland as a GM of mostly music for a little bit and that's when I really just started kind of getting the fire to get back in. Um, and I did, you know, and I, and I was so lucky to get this opportunity. So for me, man, it's really just kind of about listening, paying attention. I think listening and not just to radio, but like, you know, I mean, Che and I have had, I mean, millions of talks, you know what I'm saying? Throughout our life, like millions, you know what I mean? And he's given me great advice and I, and I'd like to think obviously I've given him good advice, but I think that's it, you know, kind of going back to what we talked about. Yeah, like that we talked about earlier, man, is that, you know, I think there's so many young people, not just young, you know, because I hate saying that it's it's not just young people. It's there's older people that have been in the industry as well that do it, that um, that spend too much time listening to themselves and just talking instead of just shutting up, 
taking in some information, you can agree with it or not, but at least, you know, taking it in and, and, you know, taking your time and say, all right, well, this person did this. Why did that work for them? And, and accepting your failures, man. Cause I'll tell you, like when I went to UTA and it didn't work, I, you know, there was a moment where I was just like, you idiot. Yeah. I was like, you just gave up, you know, 19 years in radio building something that you built all this time to kind of roll the dice and take a chance on something. But you know, at the end of the day, it's like, you, you gotta, you gotta get out of your comfort zone once in a while. And it was honestly the best thing I ever did now in retrospect. I'm so happy I did it. You got to learn from your mistakes, man. Like that's, that's the key. That's what I've learned through the process. Like it's okay to fuck up for sure. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, similar, similar to what his response is, I would say, um, you know, there was a, what I call the gift and the curse of working with Kanye West. And this is where it gets really good. This is what I've been this, waiting for. I'm, I'm uh, pulling up my seat now. Strap so it this in. Is, this is after let's you wrap up. To the, let's get to the Kanye stuff. This is after you wrap up with Dre, right? So you move on. Uh, wrap up with Dre. Um, little known fact. Some people know this. Some people don't know this. I named Beats by Dre. Um, wow. So Dre Hold stopped. Up, let's, let, let that marinate for two seconds. Don't just drop that. You know what I mean? Keep it pushing. Like yeah. you named um, what is one of the iconic talk brands. Talk that talk, CP. Talk yeah. that talk. Um, so Dre, I still had this hunger to make records, though. I still had this hunger to work with artists. Dre mm-hmm. was signing some artists, but he wasn't putting records out. You got to remember, Dre was on his bill. He was on his billionaire game, and you know, I you know, I gave him the name. But it wasn't a business deal. It was something I just gave, you know, gave. As a matter of fact, we have a mutual friend we grew up with named Todd Krinsky, who was at Reebok. The name was actually for a sneaker. So Krinsky had been bugging me for a while to pitch Dre. Dre had always said no. There became a time where the money started drying up in the music business, if you remember around the recession time. Mm-hmm. And Dre and Jimmy started looking at different things, opportunities of making money. So um, Dre, who had, who had constantly always said no when I asked him about meeting with Reebok and the sneaker deal, comes to me one day and he's like, okay, let me hear what Reebok has to say. So I go back and tell Todd. So Todd and them, they come, they put their pr- presentation together and all this stuff. Long story short, presentation was very sterile. It, was, it wasn't personal enough. So I was like, you got to personalize it somehow. So I said, I came up with his name. I was like, you got to call it, what does Dre do? He does beats. I said, call it Beats by Dre. Like, you know, got to make it something. And he go, and so they give the presentation to it. Dre loved the name, he loved the name. Famous story Jimmy tells. They go on the beach. They go yes, in the, in the movie, they tell us, he tells us a story. I was just about to ask you about this, go ahead. Dre, goes, Dre has a beach house and next to his house, Donald Erling, Donald Sterling, owns the patch of land next to Dre's beach house in Malibu. And Donald Sterling hasn't built a house on there and he won't let anything there. So it's like an empty lot. So that's what Dre will walk, Dre and Jimmy were walking. And famous story, you know, Jimmy says, hey, you know, and, and Peter Paterno is Dre's lawyer. He, he's like, Jimmy was like, oh, I was talking to Peter. He's like, you know, and everyone always does this funny voice when they imitate Jimmy because he's got this funny voice. Like the, like the, um, the dude from the Jetsons. But anyway, Jimmy goes, I was talking to Peter and he tells me you're thinking about doing this sneaker deal. And Jimmy goes, fuck sneakers, let's do speakers. And Dre, and Dre loves it. And the you know, light goes off and Dre's like, I got the perfect name. And then the rest is history and they did Beats by Dre. And um, everyone always asked me, did I get any money for it? No, I didn't get any money for it. I got an SSL <laughs> board, which at the time was valued yeah. at about 90 grand. Nowadays, it's worth about 15 grand. <laughs> I think I gave it away to charity. So let's, we'll, we'll leave that story there. <laughs> Damn it, man. Long story, I leave, I leave, um, I leave Dre. Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like, kind of you're like. Going through, you're going through it a little bit. Yeah, I'm kind of like Jeff. I was kind of like searching for my next move. I had, uh, I had met this guy, this Middle Eastern billionaire um, who, uh, owned the house that Dre bought. Dre bought this house in Hollywood for a while, in Hollywood Hills. And he bought it from this guy named Nabil Barakat, who was a good friend of mine from Jordan um, that lived in LA, older gentleman, like in his 60s, but really, really nice dude. And so we were playing around with ideas and just, he had a son who was into the music business, who was interested in it. 
And we were floating around ideas. And one of the ideas I had was investing in Kanye West. I knew Kanye, I knew Kanye could influence kids with fashion. I was real familiar with Kanye's blog and, his, and I was real familiar with some of the stuff he was doing in fashion. I was real cool with G. Robeson, who was his manager at the time. I was real cool with John Monopoly, who was his former manager. I was real cool with Don C. I had met Kanye, but I didn't know him well. So I had got wind of Kanye was looking at fashion and looking to do something in fashion. So Nabil was like, hey, I got $7 million in investment money for you. So I was like, all right, well, let me go meet with G. Robeson. Unbeknownst to me, was kind of on his way out of being Kanye's manager. But he still was able to broker the meeting. So he brokered this meeting with Kanye. I go in and sit down with Kanye. I'm like, yo, I know you're, I, I know you're going to do something great in fashion. I got some money I want to try to invest with you. Kanye's like, yeah, you know, we're going to do a fashion show in Paris. And he's, he's, we're getting some stuff going. I got a little fashion office in London. Kanye had no business plan, no financial plan, no infrastructure, no nothing. So, of course, the investor was like, oh, hell no. So then Kanye was like, well, damn, Che, well, fuck, we got to do something together. He's like, I got this label. He's like, I need some help with this label. You want to help me with the label? So I really came in kind of as this consultant producer A&R, which is really how I, I started with Kanye. We actually closed the deal in Boston at the hotel room in Boston before, uh, before Watch the Throne concert in Boston. This was around Watch the Throne time. So I ended up going on tour with Watch the Throne and doing all that. And that's how I started working with Kanye. And, and you know, Kanye years were, you know, it was uh, ended up being a lot more kind of an executive role because there was really no infrastructure. There was really no staff. You know, the Kanye years, it was primarily me and Noah Goldstein which was Kanye's engineer. Yeah, it was you, Izzy, Noah. Noah yeah, right? Izzy, Izzy was his manager. So, and Izzy would help out on some label stuff and Kanye stuff. We all, we all had to help out on anything Kanye related. So if Kanye was making a record, it was all hands on deck. And then on the good music side, Izzy would weigh in, but the good music side, it was really me and Noah in the trenches with the good music stuff. Um, and so you just, you know, you just learn because you realize you know, you're, 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 you're with, a, with, a, with a loose cannon superstar at the top of his game. You know what I mean? So he had just come off, you know, Dark Twisted Fantasy, and then he went into fucking, you know, Watch the Throne. You know what I mean? And, you know, arguably Dark Twisted Fantasy was one of the best albums he had ever done. You know, obviously he did eight or Best albums all the time. Yeah, but Dark Twisted Fantasy, arguably one of the best hip-hop records ever. So, I mean, this guy's at the height of his game. You know what I mean? And... What was great about that was, yeah, I was considered at this point, I'm, I'm on my way to being considered an OG. But what was great about it is he would bring all the talent around. You know what I mean? So Kanye worked with everybody. So he worked with Hip Boy when Hip Boy was starting out. Obviously worked with Travis when Travis was starting out. He had Mike Dean, you know, um, Jeff Basker. So everybody was at the top of their game. So you, you had this collective of producers and songwriters that were all at the top of the game. And kind of being able to be a part of that, you know, just that just sharpens your blades, you know, steel, what they say, steel sharpen steel, you know what I mean? So you're, 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 you're able to see these other people in their process and you're able to be in the studio and spend time with them and share stories and, and work on music together and all that, you know, travel together. So, you know, it was, it was it being part of this good music family. So, did you have tough moments and tough times? Sure, sure. You know what I mean? He's he's a complicated guy. You know what I mean? It, it was a very challenging job and experience, but I wouldn't trade it for anything else because not only did I get a, a lesson in life, I got a lesson in culture. You know what I mean? This guy, this guy had a doctorate in culture. You know what I mean? We could be working on music and this guy would be referencing architects I had never heard of. He'd be like, make it sound like such and such Brazilian architect. And you'd be like, what? <laughs> so I'd have to go home and Google it and study the shit and be like, and, you know, come back the next day like I knew what I was talking about. You know what I mean? I mean, the, 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 the references this guy would make, and he was influenced by art, architecture, uh, science, da, da, da. So, you know, and bringing that and applying that into music and making music and making design and stage design and fashion. And so it was, just a, it was a whole new world where, you know, I came from just strictly the studio and the music. You know, it was like, whoa, it was deep. You know, he had the Virgils of the world, 
you know, Matt Williams, you know, the guys that end up launching Ben Tro, you know, Vir Virgil and some of these guys arguably run fashion now. You know, these were these were part of his core team, you know. So then you know. so I guess the question then becomes well, before we get to that question, um, around this time you're doing key pieces like that cruel summer album. Like, yeah. There's incredible records, like some of my favorite, you yeah, know, he, he mercy, baby. Yeah, some of my favorite Kanye connected records, like New God Flow, like, and to me, that's that's almost in many ways, that's kind of almost like pushes starring moments on those out on that album. Like, I think he just did some incredible work on there. Like, so what was it like putting that project together? Absolute insanity, because the project went on and had many. I think the inspiration and the direction of the project changed, you know, a, a couple mm -hmm. of times because Kanye might have had one idea, you know, maybe it was going to be this instrumental art piece and then maybe it was going to be this and then maybe it was going to be that. So it ch it changed. It was recorded all over the world and that was another challenge to it, which was a, which was a, which which was great preparation for Jesus because Jesus was primarily pre uh recorded in Paris. So it prepared me for recording in foreign countries to some extent because we did uh we did um cruise summer we did it in new york la qatar um london and probably a couple other places that i'm forgetting um but it was you know that journey of doing it and recording it in all these places and all these different recording environments and all these situations you know, it just really gets your skill level up crazy. You know what I mean? Like it just, you, you, in terms of working with, you know, part of my job was to manage the talent too. You know what I mean? So not only did I contribute production wise, but I also had to be the ringleader in dealing with all these creatives and, you know, we find these people in foreign countries and managing it because at the end of the time, you know, there's a lot of money being spent. So we had to, you know, we had to deliver. He had expectations, you know, it's like, okay, cool. I got Manny Fresh, Frank Ocean, Hit Boy, um, Plain Pat, um, uh, Anthony Kilhoffer, Mike Dean, all in the Lanesbury Hotel in in London, all with seven studio setups. And I got we got a man, me and Noah got a man and no, and Izzy have to manage all this chaos around us going on, all this music being created, get results. That's just the producers, not to mention all the different artists coming in and out. Push a track, you know, all the different artists that were a part of it, you know, and, and managing the chaos and managing the expectations at the same time, still delivering for Kanye, who at the, you know, who expects excellence. He's like Steve Jobs in that regard, right? He, he's expecting nothing but excellence. So it really like, it really sharpens your skill set. You know what I mean? It really, it really, um, it really was a, a life changing experience, to be honest. You know, how, but how, that's got to be super stressful to be working in in with all those variables, you know, as a as a creative person. It you can be exciting, gray. but it if huh? I had a beard, the whole beard would be great. Uh, you see, that, right? <laughs> so the, you earned those working with Kanye. Yeah, I didn't have any gray before I started there. You know what I mean? Now I'm all gray. So then, how how did that kind of, you? So you worked on the. Cruel Summer and then continued on. Let's talk to me about more about what, that whole process of working with him as you, how well, that, um, how your relationship and your position kind of evolved. What really helped me is uh, Kanye was a big fan of the Lauren album. So that really helped me. And it always, he'd always, um, I think there was always a certain level and I'm older than Kanye. So yeah. there was always a certain, and it's also still that Boston, right? We got that Boston mentality. You know what I mean? I think the one thing me and G, both of us can attest to is that we're feisty. We ain't never been punks and we never, we're never gonna be punks. Mm -hmm. So as much as I respected Kanye, it was all, it had to be a mutual respect. You know what I mean? I was never one to be like, you're never, you're never gonna punk me. You're never gonna, you know what I mean? The theatrics don't work with me. So because I, I think there was always this level of mutual respect with me, Kanye always dealt with me a certain way. And, and, and that, helped us be able to communicate better and, and get things done. And I think, and maybe it is a le level of just being older and already having worked with Dre and Dre's a particular personality himself and, you know, and he rocks a certain way and being able to navigate that. I think 
I don't know how it would have went if I had went from if I hadn't gone from Dre to Kanye and I had gone straight to Kanye. I might not have been able to last in that situation. I might have lasted six months and been out of there. But because of being with Dre for eight years, I was able to really coexist with Kanye. You know, I was with Kanye for seven years. Me, Izzy, me, Izzy, um, and Noah was some of the longest people to work with Kanye, longest tenure from outside of the people that started with him, like a Don C that worked with him early in his career. From the later iteration of Kanye, we were some of the longest tenured people to be there. You know, but where, where, how, how did things kind of leave off? How did you end up well, leaving? I, it, I think, I think everything on? runs it. Everything runs its course. You know what I mean? I think um, every it, it was time. It was time for the next chapter in my life, similar similar to G, where you know you got to be passionate about what you you got to be you got to love what you're doing and you got to be passionate about. For me, I always. I'm always on a journey for inspiration and I, I, I want to love what I do and be inspired by it. Shit, you know, you know, Kanye's on his own journey, right? You know, he starts talking, you know, he starts wearing the Trump hat. He starts, shit gets a little, starts going a little left. You know, I've always rocked with dude. Dude has always said some wild shit different times. And sometimes you don't, you know, you know, in the, in the seven years I was there, there were many times he said some wild shit publicly. But I'm not keeping it 100. The Trump shit threw me. You know, um, he came in the room one day with the Trump hat on. He was like, so what do you feel about this? And, it, and, I, and I was like, you know, I really don't feel anything about it because I don't really feel like you read enough to really know enough about why you're wearing this hat, you know? And um, I started losing my taste for this situation. Um, I don't really feel like he invested in good music like he should have been because I feel like good music was such an opportunity in terms of what he could do for these artists and so on and so forth. I think Kanye was more focused and, and, and maybe as maybe as he should be, as, as you see, Yeezy is a billion dollar brand now and he's a billionaire. And maybe that was where, he, you know, he was supposed to be putting his energies in. But I saw that, you know what I mean? And I realized he wasn't really caring about the music in the artist. Like, and so it was time for me to move on. You know, so now now let's let's talk about what you guys have moved on to. You know, we're now sitting on. A, I don't know, G. You gonna are we gonna drop the bomb today? You gonna give me some good information, exclusive? I'm giving you absolutely nothing other than this the guy, that, man. Come on, man. Me and you supposed no, to be me and no, you. No, I'm. Uh, I have taken a position uh, over at, at Sirius XM, and we are working on putting together some uh, new incredible. Uh, urban platforms let's just put it that way it's going to there's a couple of channels that we're going to be launching that are, i'm pretty excited about so uh stay tuned because there'll be a lot to talk about when there's time to talk about it but yeah that's what we're doing right now all right well i'm gonna ask che, that's, that's I'm, bigger. i know che <laughs> is going to give me an answer che one of the things that i've noticed and you've been doing it um for the last few weeks since this whole craziness that we've been going through has been going on you've been doing a temperature check tell us a little bit about the temperature check and and how that's playing into what you're doing now um well i've been actually working on what i've i left good music officially october 20th 2018 mm -hmm. which is the last day that i have actually spoken to kanye west um there's no beef we're cool there's no beef we do have to, there is something we have to talk about in the future but that's that's a, a kanye che conversation um so the reason I brought that up is August 2018, I had dinner with Dan Gilbert. Dan Gilbert is the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers and he is the uh, founder of Quicken Loans. So in that dinner in August, 2018, Dan asked me what I wanted to do next. He had a feeling, he's, he met Kanye. So he had a feeling that I might wanna move on from Kanye West. Um, that's just, that gives you an idea of the, the, the meeting between Kanye and Dan. And then Dan was like, hmm, this guy, this guy who works with it might want to do something else in with his life. So I um I had this idea, which I which is funny. Uh prior to now, I, I haven't really talked much publicly about it. I've hinted on it in various interviews and podcast things. I've 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 mentioned it briefly, but I haven't really yeah, talked seeing that. But what it is, I wanted to start a company that basically was a talent incubator. Um, as we know, record companies don't do talent development anymore. So there's a real need for talent development and someone to help artists level up. 
So I had this idea for this company and Dan loved the idea. So Dan was like, I'll partner with you. And we've been working on that since August, 2018. And that's a testament to how long it takes to get something done. Mm -hmm. um, still not done. The, still, the deal's still on the table. We're still working on it. The company actually launches Sunday, May 3rd. It's, it's been from August, 2018 to, eight, to May 3rd, 2020 in the making. Um, I would say that when quarantine time came about, I already launched my podcast earlier this year called Q&A with Che that we, we launched and we put putting out. And it's really been about information in a form in informing artists and really helping artists just have more information out there. Kind of like the questions you can't Google, you know what I mean? Like really where you would get game, like if you met somebody in person and they pulled you aside and gave you game, that's what Q&A was designed to be. It's really about where you're getting game from, like kind of like what you're doing here where you're really getting stories and journeys from these people. And so I launched Q&A with Che and that's been, that, that is actually something that I actually had two years ago. And I did a deal with Russell Simmons with, but right, and we announced it in Billboard. And then right after that, Russell got me too. So- So it, you were gonna do it through all deaf, all deaf so it, Yeah, so the deals with, with Russell and he, and Russell announced it, Ixnay the Russell deal. So I put it on the shelf and then we relaunched it at the top of this year. Um, so in the quarantine thing, I was invited to be an, a guest a &R in somebody's IG live, shout out to Anthony Kilhoffer. And I was a guest in this a &R and the quality of this, the music was so, so it was like, Hmm, it was like, you know, it was cool. There was some cool joints here and there, but overall there was a lot of, a lot of trash. So I was like, you know what? I get a lot of submissions from a lot of cool artists that follow me and producers and songwriters. So I was like, I came up, you know, a play on the Corona thing with the temperature check and the virus and the quarantine. And so I launched this show called Temperature Check. We had logos made for it and we launched it. I didn't know if anyone, I didn't know if anyone was going to come into the chat, you know, I think I did an IG live before that and like maybe got eight people. So I had no idea if, you know, anyone was going to care enough to do it. And the first day I did it, I ended up playing for two and a half hours. And that's just off submissions. You know, two and a half hours. And what, what really stood out to me was the quality of the submissions. So everybody in the community was like, yo, you got to do this again. You got to do it again. So I did it again. The next time we went three and a half hours and the quality in the bar went higher. So I did it again. The next time we went four and a half hours and I was like, all right, that's too much. Four and a half <laughs> hours is too much. I was like, I was, I left out. You would think I ran a little mini marathon or something, a 5K. <laughs> By the time I finished, I was exhausted. I went, my wife was like, would you just come from the gym or something? I was like, nah, from this temperature check. But it became a thing. And now we're on our, we, I'm on my fifth episode. Tomorrow will be my sixth episode. I've got a community of about, I would say there's about 60 regulars. And I would say it's about four to 500 people that pass through the room. I've found probably about 25 amazing artists. I probably found about 50 producers. So the talent level that's coming through here is higher. Now it's to the point that I'm getting outside offers to take it off of IG Live and make it something else. So, you know, we have to entertain what temperature check can be now. You know, so, um, man, you just sometimes you just got to put things into the ether and in the world. And, Yo, and, and especially it's, it's so funny you say that, Jay, because I, I think that that's the key for like right now, especially because everything's different. Right. Like everything's different forever in some form yeah. or fashion. Like yeah. there's a lot of like a lot of I hear a lot of people saying like, oh, I can't wait till it gets back to normal. None of us know what the, there, there is yeah. no normal. You know what I'm it's saying? Like you normal. Yeah, there's going to be a new normal. So it's like exactly. you got to kind of take what's going on now and kind of just, you, you know, um, you know, Greg, you know, my girl, you know, Marlene, she, she had given me this passage a long time ago that I still live by. And it's just just it's a long passage, but it's about adapting and prospering. You know what I'm saying? You have to adapt with what's going on. And that's the only chance you have to prosper down the road. Like people are going to sit back and complain and say, oh, I wish things were different. Oh, things have changed. Oh, it's not the way it used to be. It's never going to be the way it's used to be. You know what I mean? You gotta, you gotta never. be, you gotta be like water, right? You gotta flow and you gotta, and that's what, that's why I love it. Like when I see, you know, what Shay does, like Shay's always been somebody, you know, and I've given him shit about it a lot of times before that he's always been like this, you know what I'm saying? Like 
he'll be doing beats, but, you know, he'll be opening a sneaker store or he'll be doing this and doing that. But the reality is it's like that's kind of how you got to move in this game. Like you got to be flexible. You got to kind of have your hand in a lot of different things. Come back to your core and be and focus on being really what you're good at. But, you know, don't be afraid to jump out and, and touch other things and try things like, a, you know, Che had never done a podcast. Well, now he's got a podcast and it's going good. Yeah, now he never, just he know, pops, right, pops up on IG Live. Boom. You know what I mean? About, like, you know, G talked about speaking on the mic, you know, like I wouldn't even speak in oral presentations at Brookline High. Now I do speeches. You right. know what I mean? Like, yeah. You got to You do got to step out of your comfort zone. He, he made a really good point that I wanted to reiterate, too is you gotta, you gotta listen, you gotta keep, you you know, you gotta, um, I'm still cool with a lot of, I guess, quote unquote, OG producers and executives from the business and the ones that have stayed relevant and that stayed in the business and are still relevant and, and still around are the ones that listened. You know, you can't mm-hmm. just be the one talking down to somebody, you gotta listen, you gotta, mm-hmm. you gotta be agile and you gotta stay learning. The biggest lesson I got to sit with last year, I got to sit with Quincy Jones for three hours and one of the things that I said to him is, man, you've been doing this for seven decades. You know what I mean? You know, professional, you know, just a professional for seven decades. That's just amazing, comp, you know, thing when you think about it. You know what I mean? Um, and I was like, how do you stay? How have you stayed relevant? How have you stayed the test of times? And he said, I stayed learning. I stayed listening. I stayed agile. You know, I stayed fearless, meaning he had gotten, he had a family. He had a cushy job in the, at the record business. He decided, I want to go do scores. And he left the cushy job in the record business and went and, and, and built a score, you know, and, and became, a, you know, a composer. You know, he, he just kept being fearless. And I think you're going to have some tough times and some nervous times. And But if you, if you work hard and you're true to what you believe in, like you said, like he said, go back to your core, you're gonna, the success will come. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's that belief system in yourself, though. You know what I mean? Because, with time, you know, it doesn't mean things aren't going to be tough. They're going to be tough. You know, he went, you know, G went 20 years in the radio business and was like, yo, I'm going to go be an agent. I ain't going to lie. I was like, what the fuck? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what? He probably said the same thing. Like, you know, okay, yeah. this guy's going to go start another company. Che, like, what are you doing? Like, go get a job. Right. At a and I'm right. like, no, I, I don't, I don't want to work for anybody anymore. You know, I want to work for myself. You know, and it's a crazy time to start a company. I got two kids. You know, I got one kid in college, one kid about to be in college. You know, mm-hmm. so this gotta work. Whatever you're doing, it's yeah, gotta you know, work. You know, no failure is not an option, baby. <laughs> well, you you know what? Both you both talked about getting back to the core, and for yeah, uh, thank you. I was just about to ask you to do that. Um, you both talked about getting back to the core, and for both of you, the core is this town. And one of the big problems that we've seen is that we have, you know, outside of the success of New Edition and New Kids and a couple of other, you know, a couple of spots here and there, we haven't had that sustained moment in the light. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had talent. I mean, even now, as I look in the chat, I see a few, a lot of that talent. I see Super Smash Bros. Those dudes are monsters. Mm -hmm. DJ and, and production team, they're in there. I see, who else? I see a couple of people. I see my man Nelly Pro Tools in there. Shout out Kelly, my guy. Yeah, my brother Joe so, Politics is in there. So, well, l- so let me ask. You, we, let me ask. You, as we get you, to that, what do, you, what do you mean? What do you like? I I, want, I just want to because I, I always hear this. Obviously, we've had this conversation mm-hmm. in terms Absolutely. of in terms of sustained, right? Like, what are we talking about there? Because I think that really outside of New York, Los mm-hmm. Angeles, Atlanta area, right? Um, if we're talking about this hip hop urban music world thing, right? Chicago, obviously, to a degree as well. We're also talking about cities that are Texas, much, lo- much like larger, Houston. right? Mm-hmm. Much larger than what we're talking about in the Boston metro area. Shit, Brooklyn's bigger than Boston. It's in itself, right? Yeah. So I think that's that's problem number one. We got to look at size, right? Mm-hmm. It's very small. It's very contracted. The talent pool, although as we all know, there's massive talent coming out of there. It's, it's not as large as it is in some of these other cities. There isn't the infrastructure to support. Um, yeah, you don't have those people it, of influence. Yeah, there's not a consistent support group that can, that can launch these things, right? Like, you know, it can't be 
just a radio station. Like I know there's so many people that say, well, just get my song on the radio. And I'm like, like, that's, that's dead. Like, that's, that's the least not, of your that's, problem. That's, that's not even, that's not even the beginning part. Right. Um, you know, I think, you know, to something to what you said earlier is like, if you look at some of the success stories that have come out of Boston though, right. What, what can we learn from it? Right. So obviously guru, a little different, went to New York, linked up mm-hmm. with Premier, right. Um, you got Shay, you got myself, you know, we're talking about, um, you got somebody, somebody look like Static Selecta. Static yeah. is arguably the most influential, traditional East Coasting sound producer that's doing it right now. You know what I'm like? He, he, it, he embodies the, the, you know, New York sound, yeah, um, New York you know, B-boy, yeah. yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like that, um, you look at, um, even guys, you know, I used to laugh a little bit because, Obviously, with the launch pad, I used to get so many, so many submissions. And, and, and it was interesting how like Boston was sort of divided for a while. And I'd like to think that I bridged it a little bit where you kind of had the underground scene. Right. Well, if you look at kind of that underground scene, even going back 10, 15, 20 years ago, you had guys like Acrobatic, Mr. Lift, 7 L and Esoteric, Terminology. Mm-hmm. These guys saw the world. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. they're not household names in terms of. Uh, you know, my mom couldn't, well, my mom would because she knew, but, but <laughs> in terms of making a career and in terms of making money and in terms of making a life out of hip hop coming out of Boston, these guys did fairly well. Um, you know, join her, join That brings up a good point you bring, right? Yeah. You look at, you look at Stiz, you look at Michael Christmas, you look at, um, you know, join Lucas. I mean, there's, it's, it's started, you know, that there are success stories, you know, and I, yes, it's not sustainable and massive like you would see out of New York, Houston, but that has more to do with what the core is, the support system and the size of the city. Okay, so, and, and, well, keep it, and keep it and keep in mind, these are conversations that happen in many other cities besides Boston. Yeah, these are absolutely. conversations that happen in Milwaukee. These are conversations that happen in D.C., you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, if you're talking you know, about, I'm in, I'm in Detroit yeah, all the time. And, right, you know, Detroit. I mean, these are same. Guys, Boston is not Detroit. unique yet. Boston's not in LA all the time. Conversation. Yeah, this these happen in all these mid, you know, mid-sized cities as well. So I, I think where I'm talking about is you're right because when you, we talk about the terms of the world, who actually you know term has has not had a day job and he ain't been living in his mama's basement for a long ass time. He's yeah. been getting. He's been taking care of himself and his family and seeing the world, like you said, off of rap. I think mm-hmm. the, that last little hurdle um, that we're that we could, that many times we're talking about or when this conversation comes up is that sustained, like top of the chart, like mm-hmm. mainstream success. So, for example, the people that are close and touching that now are joining Lucas or a Stiz who's doing mm-hmm. a record with the City Girls, and and you know mm-hmm. what I mean. So yeah. they're in that space, and I think that that's the thing that's i think that's the last piece of the hurdle because when we look at even we look at somebody like che che has been in the business all this time and has been a part of major major pieces and records and has has had a sustained success you see what i'm saying yeah we're let's get i think the the piece that we're looking for now and i I hear a lot of the conversation is that star you know know, recently we had bia where she broke through and she did the record Mm -hmm. with russ that's another one. B is B is on her way. You know what I mean? I think B is. I think so. And B is, and B, and B, and B is that you know the thing you know, and that's also a, a, a testament of her resilience too, because you have to absolutely. say absolutely. Bia has absolutely. already been on her way, and then you know what I mean. We had we're rocking with Pharrell and all them. We had to fall back from that, rebuild it, and redo it, and you know, and reimagine it. So. It, it is yeah, she's been right. And her deal at RCA has been there for a while. I mean, they went through a lot of records yeah. recently, you know. Think about but yeah, I, I mean, my first Stiz show that I went and saw Stiz in LA, it was like 20 people, maybe, maybe 15. You know what I mean? And look at Stiz is just grinded and grinded and stayed with it. And I think I, he brought up you brought up a good point that I wanted to bring up. I wanted to talk to because especially since my cousin was in the was in the thing. So Mo Pope, sure. as you know, has been an artist and a local artist for a long time in Boston. And I used to get questions. I bring up, like, I tell people my cousin rapped and this and that years ago. And they were like, why didn't you never put him on? And, and he coming from the Boston area, like, why didn't you ever blow him up? And I, and I think it's very important that we distinguish right here what type of music someone makes. Do they Absolutely. make music that, that you can take and you can put it on a bigger stage? Not everyone does that. So you have to make music that can go to a bigger stage that can level up. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? 
because when I'm in my position, when I'm in my room, like, okay, so let's say I, I get a record from Mo, Mo might have sent me a record and I'm sitting there with Kanye. I might be in their studio. I might get five minutes where it's just me and Kanye in the room and I play that record. That record got to, he got to, I got to play something because it reflects on me too. I got to play something that, that Kanye is like, yeah, what's that? I can't play something that has me looking crazy. And, and, you know, and Mo never knows, never knew this, but I played Mo, I played Kanye and Mo record. Mm. You know, and, and, and I love my cousin, but, you know, but Kanye was like, keep that in the backpack. Wow. <laughs> But okay, but listen. And, that's, this, and, and the only point yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't. That was not a good. criticism of Mo by any means. Absolutely that was not. a point to make. That if you want to come from Boston or an out of market place, you have to make music that can stand up where, when you go into these bigger markets. So when it gets put against Future, when it gets put against Playboy Cardi, when it gets put against Uzi, when it gets put against Travis, it can stand up. When it gets put against Griselda, when it gets put against, you know, whoever, it can stand up. You know what I mean? I mean, and, you know, and, and Joyner Lucas, I think, is a very interesting um, thing because what I think for me caught my attention with him more than the music, especially the early stuff, it wasn't necessarily what he was doing musically that caught me. It's his visuals. Like his mm-hmm. videos from early on were so theatric and out the box. I was like, yo, what is this? And obviously that's continued today with the Will Smith thing and like mm-hmm. his visuals and his his focus in on making his visuals pop even maybe more than the records did. That was just another route that he took. That's what got my attention for sure. Yeah, I mean, he, can rap, he, can, he can rap his ass off, don't get me wrong, yeah, but I mean, his visuals absolutely. were crazy. Yeah, but I think that's it. I think it was the rapping and the visuals that was his you know what I mean? That was his way in. Everyone finds their thing, right? You know what I mean? Like yeah. everyone finds their, you know, the ones that get through the door because there's so much traffic, right? You got to figure out how to get through that line, just like you're running back. Okay, who's my part, this line? Yeah. But part of, I think, our problem is, too, is we have a brain drain. You know, you both experienced some of the bigger success in your careers after you left home. You know what I mean? So how is it that we can kind of re- reconnect and establish those those lines? But that, where, but that's so just the, not necessarily that's a, to, not necessarily to hold you guys. I'm like I'm not trying to hold you guys responsible for that. I'm saying how do we connect and keep that information coming back home so we can pull the next person along? You know, and in in some cases, like we've seen, like what what Stiz has done. Listen, I I give that dude so much respect and props because. I went to the I went to the House of Blues the first year they did the House of Blues, right? This guy started off from the small room in the Middle East, mm-hmm. right? And to the big room in the Middle East. To the big room at the Middle East, to over to Paradise, yep. and built himself up and not and and sold out the House of Blues with his name as the headliner. It wasn't him mm-hmm. and his friend. It wasn't him and his famous friend. It was him. <clears throat> People were coming to see him. Right. So but Greg, to that, to, that, to that point, though, right, I would mm-hmm. I would argue that Stiz isn't that mega star. Right. But he's he's building. Right. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he's constant. And, and obviously it is resonated here in his hometown as much as it has, you know, other places like he's not probably doing twenty five hundred tickets necessarily out the gate in Kansas City. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nobody does. You know but what I'm he, saying? But he did what he did in Boston. Mm-hmm. He did that in LA too. Keep that Facts. in mind. Yeah, he's so building it. He's building it. That's my point. Is that it's hundred? You know, yeah. so he came into a big market and did the same thing. You know, yep. what I mean? mm-hmm. so after he did it in Boston, he did it in LA. Yeah, very, very important. Sure. You know, same thing with G. G did it in Boston, and then he did it in New York. I did. Mm-hmm. I had to do it. I got started in Virginia, and then I had to go to New York. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, Greg. And I would also say, too, like when you say that most of the success happened when we left here, that's true. And it's not. I think it's it's more of um, my base. And I think Che's base were always established here. But there's only so much you can do when there's not really there's not an industry infrastructure in only but two cities. There's New York, there's L.A. And let's throw Atlanta in just because in somewhat Miami. Um, Absolutely. So, it, I mean, it's just it's just every single day that there's something in a, and there's a networking thing to do. So obviously you're going to grow and build relationships outside of the city more than you're going to here. You know what I mean? And also, you know, for New York, it's when you're talking about market number one, 
the spotlight's just that much brighter and it's going to get more recognized. But I don't think in terms of the core of the work, um, you know, and, and look, and I just saw somebody ask, how do you, how do you build the infrastructure here? I, think, I don't know. I don't know I, that I, you build an infrastructure there or, or, or I think you build a bridge. And I think yes, what I mean correct. by a bridge is that wherever is popping, meaning if it's LA, if it's New York, if it's Atlanta, that those cities are aware of what's going on in Boston. You know what I mean? And I think there's a bridge because it, it's about awareness. You know, we're in the social media game now, right? Mm -hmm. we're in the information age and the digital age. You know what I mean? So it's really about that awareness and, and something being that bridge that, that allows that, that awareness and that communication. Um, yeah, and keep in mind too, I mean, if we're just talking about urban culture as well, we're taking it like a step back from even the music side of it, right? I mean, you look at, um, you look at a company like Concepts. I mean, they're a worldwide brand that was based out of Absolutely. Cambridge, Massachusetts. You know what I mean? Like they're one of the, and well, not just concepts. We'll talk about Bodega. You know, and you look and see, right, and, no, right, and you look at what the what the, the Boston, the Boston sneaker scene has become, which you know is attributed to urban hip hop culture. Obviously, it's probably the biggest outside of New York or LA, and probably stands up against any of those boutiques in the world. So I, I think that. You know, or even you know, even though it 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 ended up not working, you even look and see what Karma Loop was for the for the time that they were right. They were like the probably first online massive. And they really, and if you, you think know, about Karma Loop, yeah. they, they paved the way for StockX and these other companies. You know, Correct, is a billion dollar company. So, yeah. there would so be no there's StockX yeah, so Karma there's Loop. ways I think for you know it to crack through. Which you just you got to build the right thing, and you got to build the right product, and you got to build the right. Like I said, I I, I don't think a a Hip hop music infrastructure solely based in Boston is sustainable. I, the, the resources just aren't there, and to be honest, the demographics aren't there to support it on a mass scale, right? Um, you know, yeah, like, like it, 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 yeah, yeah. It, as 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 pop driven and as as multicultural as hip hop is, right? One would say, well, yeah, but everybody likes hip hop. There there needs to be a industry core of businesses. Um, you know, labels built there. It just, I don't, I don't think that part of it's sustainable, but I like what Chase said in terms of they're, they're very easily can be a bridge, um, especially now in the digital age to, to make those things happen for sure. So when we talk about that bridge and I know we've been on for a while, we've been on for mm -hmm. a minute. Um, uh, so we're, a couple more questions. And if we can sneak a, a question or two from the folks that are here. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Um, what, so how does one build that bridge to you guys in your respective roles? You know, G with you as a radio programmer um, and, and Che with you as, as a label exec and, and producer, how does an artist who is coming from here, from home, how does he get to the point where, you know, other than harassing Mo Pope to send us to his cousin, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we get that bridge to you guys so that we can have those conversations? Yeah, G, I'll take this one first. Yep. Um, I work with artists right now from all over the world. So mm -hmm. if, 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 if a guy can get to me from Turkey, you know what I mean? And, and if and someone can't get to me from Boston, then they're not doing it right. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm accessible. And, and, and you can see it when you go on temperature check, every time I do temperature check, I got Belgium. I got, I got mm -hmm. Stockholm. I got Korea. I got Germany. I got Paris and then all over the country. So you had a couple I'm, Boston too. You had a couple Boston too one time. Yep, I see some Boston folks there, and 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 there's actually quite a few actually um, from Boston mm -hmm. submissions. But I'm I'm reachable. You know what I mean? I'm definitely active. Um, you know, so for me right now, social media is the way. Um, we are launching a company that has a general email. Someone asked me how how they can submit the temperature check. You can either look in my if you see the temperature check ad, it has the website, or you can just send it to my DM. We um Tuesdays and Thursdays, two two o'clock West Coast time, five o'clock East Coast time, temperature check. So, can we get an all Boston version of temperature check? You know, I you know that that's just a matter of a Boston artist doing, you know, because I base it on the I curate it, right? So meaning I base it on the quality of submissions. So if I get enough from enough submissions from Boston that are strong enough, I'll do a Boston edition. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll let's do, I'll help you put that together because I I can name a few people that we can get in there that'll be fire. Yeah, let's, let's do it. I'm with it. For me, it's all about the quality of submissions. And right now, like you know, in my community, man, we get so much fire. Like I mean, I mean, this, shit. This times, I mean, 
I don't know if you saw the last one, but this, like some kid played me a joint. I had to put my ski mask on. <laughs> <laughs> I got doing, you know, I mean, you get, you know, they see me changing my sunglasses. I changed my sunglasses based on the reaction of the tracks. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you'll, you'll see people in the community saying, make him put his sunglasses on. You got to play something to make him put his sunglasses on, you know? And that, and that means there's so much heat, I got to put the sunglasses on. So, you know, we just, I think it for me, it, it, I'm just really active in it because I'm really looking for artists to work with. Um, I'm doing away with the concept of signing artists. I don't believe in that anymore. I believe that's an obsolete concept. That doesn't mean that when an artist gets in position, if they want to sign to a major, it doesn't mean not to do that. If you can sign to a major, and especially if you have leverage and you can get better terms in your deal, by all means, you know, sign to a major. And sometimes it's still an opportunity, meaning you may have to take that L with your first contract to get to, to, get to point B. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, hopefully my company will help you be able to do that and, and, and have better leverage if you so choose to sign to it. But we won't sign artists. We're only going to partner with artists. Okay. So for Gene, you yeah, in the radio I, space, how do you, how do you, how do we Yeah, get I mean, I think it's, it's a weird space, weird time for me right now because I'm kind of in this tweener um, developing. Um, and, you know, listen, if you're a, and, I, and I'm going to be honest, if you're an aspiring radio personality at this point and you're young and trying to get in the game, you may want to start looking for another profession and that's not to kill your dreams, but the, that, that it's really shrinking. Um, in terms of terrestrial, here's a scary part of what's, especially what's going on right now. Um, terrestrial radio is, and when I say terrestrial radio, that's like, that would be in Boston, that would be jamming, that would be Kiss 108, that would be whatever the stations are there, Hot 97 or Power, or whatever. Um, they're advertising based company so the way that everybody there gets paid is that advertising dollars come in and then people get paid and you see these sexy concerts and and so on there's zero absolutely dead zero advertising dollars coming into any of these companies right now zero um so that's scary in terms of what this pandemic and, and it was already shrinking in that sense but in terms of kind of what's going to happen. And, and it turns out there's much more people listening to radio during this pandemic than were listening before. Radio's one of these things that has exploded and is actually thriving. Um, but yeah. sadly, there's no, I mean, sadly, before. sadly, there's no money coming. So that's a scary thing. Um, kind of in the position I'm in is a little bit different series like Netflix or anything else is a subscription based. Um, so that money's already in house. Now there's other obstacles that they'll deal with down the road. Um, it's very hard and, and it was my biggest frustration point when I was finishing up at power is having great young people around me, great interns, people that wanted to get on the air, uh, people that I knew that were talented enough to get on the air. I had nowhere to put them. Um, so if you're looking to get on and, and you feel like you have the talent, obviously the first thing you want to do is somehow get in the building, um, learn how to work work in promotions, learn how to work in sales, learn how to work in marketing, learn how to be an engineer on the boards, learn how to do imaging production, just get in the building. That's first and foremost. If you can get in the building, then you can I start working. You right there. I wanted to score that. Gee, you got to say that again so I could score that. That's too, too, it's too, it's too much. There's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot. Um, <laughs> No, but you, I mean, that's, that's real, man. You just got to find a way to get in first and foremost. Um, I however, think, you can I get believe in. that that's the key with this industry, period. You got to just get in and you got to get in. You got to get in and then, and then kind of figure it out. Yeah. You get in, you network and that's how you make moves. You got to yeah. get in. You and then, I mean? um, like, and then, and also, and, and listen, in, in terms of Austin too, like, you know, there's been plenty of people, um, that were interns of mine that were at jamming, um, that have, you know, gone on to do, you know, big major things. I mean, Cheryl was one of my interns uh, at Jam and she's now Post Malone's agents, one of the biggest agents in the hip hop game. But um, you also have to be prepared to go to a smaller market, man. So if you're in Boston and that, you know, the only opportunities in Biloxi, Mississippi. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, got, you gotta, you gotta go. You know what I mean? Like if that's what you yeah. really want to do, you know what I mean? There's, um, you got to get up and you got to get moving, man, because there aren't going to be many radio opportunities unless you're willing to be extremely flexible 
and uh, yeah, it's it's, know, a, had, it's a it's a it's a tough business right now. It's tough business. I, I had um you know we had a good music studio, and I you know we had an internship program that you know I put together. And shout out to Tia who managed the studio for me. I see I see some of the good music interns, the good music studio interns all over the place. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, and the ones that went in there and took the opportunity and ran with it. You know, they got gigs, they got bigger gigs, they got real gigs. Some of them working with directly with artists now, you know what I mean? And it's, it's real. And they started, the, I mean, these guys, you know, they were making runs at three in the morning going to get chicken. You know what I mean? You know, so you, you just got to get in the door and then make moves, you know? Yeah. And you you got to have humility and be able to work hard because opportunities come. Yep. You know, well, listen, we got, a, we got a couple of people, we got a couple of people in here with us. If you cool. guys have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. And I got a couple of questions. Here's one. Um, so, do, 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 do. Um, this is from the Super Smash Bros. Shout out to y'all. Um, hey, so we're DJs who play a bit of a bigger role than just DJing. We actively produce A and R and entertain. This these dudes have actually been one of the most entertaining DJ sets. I've seen. I, hope, I saw them open for st- uh, for Stiz, Stiz, and they came through the crowd with glowing masks. Like they put on a show. So I, I can co-sign mm-hmm. that. What steps do you suggest one should take to elevate from just citywide recognition to national recognition? Well, 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 well I was going to say the one thing is national recognition on what level? Meaning as a DJ or as a performer, as an A&R, if you, if you, you do all these different things, what are we talking about? So meaning, are you trying to level up? Because I think the avenues are different. How you level up mm-hmm. as a producer is different than how you level up as a DJ. You know, how you level up as an executive is different than how you level up as a producer. You know what I mean? So, I mean, what I like is, I mean, from what just Greg just said, like, the, you have to, first and foremost, like, you have to be, especially nowadays, you have to do something a little bit different to to kind of crack through all the, the normality, right? I mean, there's so many... Um, like, yeah, I mean, listen, I think one of the very um, interesting and amazing things is like through this quarantine is looking at the IG lives, right? And you saw over the first couple of weeks, like people were just kind of playing it through their speakers and, and like, you know, it was great. You know what I mean? Like what Derek did and, and how he built up that, that, that moment uh, when he had 100,000 people. But, and so like, but now if you go on an IG live, obviously there's a lot of people doing it. It's kind of like your own radio station. But I see people are getting super creative now, right? So now they're um, they're using OBS software. They're doing there's visuals. There's um, you know you got your 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 logo splash across it. So I think I think that kind of is kind of even part of it. As if you're a DJ, like the fact that these guys came through the crowd with masks on, glow in the dark, like that's good. You know what I'm saying? Like you know, there's if if marshmallow throwing a marshmallow on his head or Danger Mouse throwing the 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 Mickey ears, like, guess what? That worked for them. Like, otherwise, they're just regular DJs playing, you know, songs for, and, you know, there's no knock on their talent, right? But there's nothing to me that really separates a lot of those guys other than the show that they put on, right? So I would say, you know, listen, a lot of us play the play the exact same music, right? You just got to play the hits. You got to play to the crowd, right? That's part of it. Um, those songs that you aren't playing that are the hits, how are you how are you freaking them like what is what what are you doing to those records that are special what is your um you know and i think you know with social media more of those moments that you have make sure that you're just you know you're distributing it to all forms of the social media the youtubes the uh, instagrams and you know i think in in that sense it's it's a lot easier for djs nowadays to at least get get the word out but you're getting the word out along with a million other DJs that are trying to do it as well. So try to stand out as much as you can, I guess. That's the, that's the easiest way. Well, standing out is not going to be a problem for those guys. Um, so I got another one from Ocho. Uh, is music management a requirement? And if so, how do you know if you need it? I'll let you handle that, Chase. My theory with that has always been when you got something to manage. So, <laughs> Fact. If you don't got a business to manage, then you know, what are you doing with the manager? You're paying somebody... Now, there's all different levels, right? Meaning you could be a starting artist and let's say you got, you're got a beginning artist and you also have a, a young manager who's willing to manage it. Maybe that's not a bad person to rock with because you got someone who's willing to invest their time and energy in you before someone else will. You know what I mean? And that's not a bad thing. You've, you've seen a lot of situations where the artist gets on now and then they shed that manager, the homeboy manager, the 
their friend manager, and they go on, step up to the bigger manager. Well, that's part of leveling up as a manager. Maybe when you realize that that artist is growing bigger, then maybe you as a manager have to level up. You have to partner. You have to go absolutely. In, you have to go in some place where you can empower yourself and strengthen yourself, so they don't leave you. You know what I mean? Because if you don't listen, I've seen it. I've seen it so many times. It's the one thing at, at UTA we used to see all the time. Like there were all these great artists we wanted to sign, but the management was just so bad that it was it, it was going to be more of a headache to sign them than not. But, you know, I do look at somebody like Dre London, who, you know, a lot of people who's Post Malone's manager, who a lot of people had a lot of jokes about because Dre wants to be flashy and whatever. But Dre leveled up. You know what I'm saying? Like, say what you want about him. You know what I'm saying? But but this guy, he got smart. He got smarter. Smarty, and he got smarter. Sm yeah, there's a lot of people. You got to, you know, got to have a manager that's with you, that's willing to 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 learn and, and grow and to, you know, and you know, if there's a question that he doesn't know, hey, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. Let me come back to you. And let me get the answer. You know what I mean? You gotta. I, I agree with Shay on that. Yeah, I agree yeah, with Shay on that. You know, someone that's literally gonna be really, really part of the solution. You yep. know what I mean? Because if they're part of the problem, and part of the problem is if they ain't doing nothing and making nothing happen, yeah, it's part of the problem. Yeah, and if you and if you have a manager that is really just a yes man that's just putting a battery in your back, that is probably the worst thing. Keep yes men as far away from you as possible, especially nowadays, especially nowadays, because it's just eating up resources. You know what I mean? You want, you want, you know, and Chay, Chay, Chay and I are a perfect example. You know what I mean? Like there's Chay and I have gotten many arguments about things that he was doing that he thought was dope. But I was like, nah, that's not that dope. And things that I was doing, he would tell me, he'd be like, why don't you try this a different way? You know, and there's been, and there's been plenty of times, like I've said to him, yeah, like, that's incredible. Great job. You know, you got to have somebody giving you positivity, you gotta, you but it just can't can't board, be so. that all the time. I think that's a good point he brought up too. You got to have sounding boards. You got to have people that you yeah. respect, and respect you to be keep it a hundred with you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because if you don't have those, and everyone's always just gassing you, then you ain't really being honest with yourself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. no, one of, yeah, one of my mentors, man, that I that I you know look up to that, that Che knows that I I you know he was manager biggest artist in the world and I bounce things off him all the time and 70% of the time he's like eh not a great idea good you know what I'm saying like that's what I need to hear you need people going to give it to you you know and again you can still decide to go do your own thing but you need to hear you need to hear what you need to hear sometimes okay so th there's another question that kind of goes back to what we were talking about um the whole idea of of what you were doing when you created the launch pad, which was having national records in alongside the, the hottest of the local, you know, yep. um, isn't that what isn't that what DJs should do in Boston clubs as well? Play local hit, well, club, hot local well, records clubs, club, along no, top ten. Club, no, clubs is a different thing. Clubs is a completely different thing. Your only objective in the two hours that you're playing is to move the crowd. That's it. And so if, 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 if now I say that to say, um, if there's a way that you can get to that moment where you can go in and you can break a record that a majority of the crowd doesn't know, but you creative or number one, that first of all, that record needs to be good enough to be able to stand up in that Sonics, right? Because you're going up against records that are mixed mastered made for the clubs. Um, Listen, if, if you're a DJ and you're good enough and, you're, and you can be creative to get one or two of those off a night, great. But you can't, you're can't. you not going to be able to sit in that pocket. Your job when you step into that club is to make the people that pay their $10, your $20, whatever, want to hear that. They, they want to hear the hits. They want to oh, drink yeah, with their girlfriends right. and they want yeah. they want to hear the hits. Now, yeah. if you're doing, you know, if you're doing a party that's catered to that, you know what I'm saying? That's more exactly. of an underground vibe, more of a hip hop vibe and you can play some more, right? You can play some more of those, but if we're talking just a regular club, nah, man, that's not. That's just that. That's you're just not. You're not doing your job as a DJ. Mm -hmm. That's the reality of it. That's a, that has to be like a curated event where people are yeah. coming, expecting to hear new artists and you know open mics. You know those type of underground situations. Yeah. That's it's a quick way for you never to play that club again. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, okay, my man. E doubles in here. What up, E double? E dub, my guy. All right, what else we got here? GIs, what up? GIs, was, do you think it's possible for an artist to develop a true fan base in New England the way that art, the way an artist from the Bay or Houston can sustain 
off the success of their region alone. We talked, we tried, we touched on this a little bit, but I think, uh, G, well, the Bay, the Bay, Con- the Bay conversation is pretty interesting. Again, I, I think Houston's a little bit different just because of the monster. I mean, you got to remember Houston's the fifth largest city in the country. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. it's not just, and it's not just Houston, it's Houston, Dallas, San Antonio. I mean, that of New Orleans, I mean, it's all right there. So it's a little bit mm-hmm. of a different beast. The Bay area is interesting. Um, and we are very similar in certain ways. The Bay area surrounds itself and takes pride in the Bay, very similar to the way that Boston people do, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Greg, I think you and I have had this conversation many times. I think part of Boston's issue sometimes is, is that we have worn this chip on our shoulder for so long (laughs) that until we kind of shred that a little bit, it's going to be a little bit difficult. Um, But the Bay Area you know, I think the hype fee and just kind of the way that they move. And you got to remember, too, it's it's San Fran and Oakland, right? Two very different cities. Um, and they had a sound. You know what I mean? Like, that, that, that's that was just... A, that was the one point I was going to interject. Yeah, there was a sound that they developed that yeah. came out of kind of the, the, you know, the L.A. thing. And it just moved yeah. north and it was Detroit, different. Detroit has a sound. Yeah, right. The area has yeah, a sound. Boston, Boston yeah, has, Boston doesn't really have, have I think, a sound in that sense. Yeah, um, identity. And, and by the way, I don't know if that's in, they necessarily, you know, need one. Um, it's, it's interesting, though, because the cities in terms of size, in terms of San Fran, they're, they're very similar. Um, and they're very homegrown and they're very prideful of their towns. Um, yeah. And but I yeah, I, break, if you break New York, you can break New England to me. So to read, yeah, to keep for sure. New England to me is you got to break New York. And listen, I will tell you this: you know, I, I I know like New England doesn't get a whole lot of credit for breaking a lot of records, or at least you know local ones for sure. It, it, it's very interesting if you look at a city like Hartford and, and WZMX and like what Buck has done there. Um, like there's so many Caribbean records that get broke out of ZMX and even jamming back in the days, not as much now. Not saying because I'm not there, but um, you know, <laughs> no things are things are just different with that station now, obviously. Um, but but you know, traditional radio, listen, radio, it's, it's that's not where things are getting broken. Things are getting broken through streaming and online. Radio is important once you get on base. Um, you know, you got to slap a single or hit a double, and then radio can get you from from second base home. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, I, in terms of you know, it's interesting. I you know I. I, I get. I guess really, just San, San Fran always kind of had that sound. I guess, and that's why it was. It was kind of able to do it, you know. So, it's, you know, I know it's that probably I didn't kinda... answer the question, but no, I think we got to it a little bit. I think it's interesting when you start talking about a sound because I feel like we have the the DNA of a sound in that we have such a large Caribbean. Um, population well, listen, it's there's funny, only, it's funny there's only three cities in... there's a, when uh-huh. it comes to reg, when it comes to reggae records there's three cities that matter to the labels and when they're breaking records and you know whether it's somewhere like popcon or or Bougie yeah. or whatever it's new york it's miami and it's boston those are the three yeah. atlanta starts to uh, is a, a little bit just because of the influence of people going to school down there and and but but really it's it's new york it's uh and we'll, we'll include Hartford and Providence a little bit in, in the, in the Boston thing as well, New England, but that's it. Those are the three markets. I mean, for the Caribbean that those are the only ones that break the breaker records, nothing in LA zero. No, of course zero, not. Zero I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think that would be, no, I would think zero, Toronto LA. before LA. Yeah. But Toronto, it, of course, too, obviously. But but yeah. I was just about to bring Canadian. up Toronto. And, I, and yeah. I think that if Boston wanted that to be the thing, then, then, then they really have to go hard with that. They really got to own it. So if the Caribbean sound is what, what, what the thing that could be it, then they really got to own it and run with it. You know what I mean? That's yep. the way Toronto does it. You know what I mean? Yep. That's where they play. That's the music they play when you go up there. You know what I mean? If you go, if you go hang out with Drake and the thing, he's playing you a bunch of London and Caribbean oh. and Jamaican. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, but you gotta really, you gotta really own it. You know what yeah, I mean? Night Owl sound. I mean, that's. I mean, look. I mean, Toronto is the second largest, I believe. I could be wrong. I believe Toronto is the second largest Jamaican population outside. I think bigger than New York. But it's um, big. Whatever yeah, it is, what yeah. you know, it's, it's I think, you know, New York's more spread out in terms of many West Indians. So, yeah, then I think, you know, that community is really push great. That. But I remember even back in the days, man, like Sunday nights at Bill's Bar, that Reagan night they did, that was, that was a legendary night. I mean, you look at somebody like Junior Rodigan and, and mm. you know, the, the, 
the, the reggae sound out of Boston has always been massive. Always. But in terms of, you know, where they went. Supported. You got to make sure. You got to make, but, 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 it, but it goes towards, you know, like, I'm sure, like, I, I mean, I don't know this for a fact, but I, I'm the Western front has been closed in Cambridge. I would imagine for a long time now. Correct. Like that doesn't very exist anymore. So. Right. Bill's yeah, bar be. Sunday nights. I doubt very much that they do reggae anymore. Um, you know, I'm sure it's still K's Oasis and, you know, the traditional Boston spots maybe are, are still popping. I don't know, but that kind of just goes to show you. It also has to do with, you know, yeah, the, you know, what it you know it, it's tough, right? Because, if you think about Deep Prosper and them with Soul and the Horn and how they've been so successful, you have to make it. Um, there's a number of boxes you got to check. One of the things is obviously number one, music got to be amazing, but you also got to make it a safe and environment and in, 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 in an inviting environment. Every time I've been to Soul and the Horn, it's been an amazing experience. You know, it's been, it's been a positive from the environment, to the music, to the to the way they've curated the crowd. You know what I mean? There's a there's a there's an event here in in LA that gee you probably heard of it now Shaba. Oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I went Shaba, to it. It's crazy Shaba is shit like mm -hmm. you know and 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 it, and it's a reggae you know it's a reggae themed event it's called Shaba and it, it brings out some of the most beautiful people in LA and the culture of LA which you're like damn I forgot LA had culture but it's mm -hmm. safe it's safe it brings all these cultures together. It, it, every time it, they do it, about once a month, it's packed. It's the shit. Mm -hmm. So it is possible, you know what I mean. But I think you got, you know, Boston really has to embrace it and 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 um and 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 support it. Let's see, we got. If I got any more questions, boom, 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 boom. We got one from our man Sean Sean Caliber. We'll make that the last one because we're. We're going for the record here. <laughs> um, All right, baby, 245. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate you guys taking the time and, and being with us. This, let's do this one for my man, Sean Calvary, super dope. Yeah. Dope MC. Uh, are, there any are there any opportunities that you definitely wanted but never got? And then in uh, hindsight, <laughs> realize it definitely, it, it was probably a good thing that you didn't get. Um, yes. Get, get it. That's a great question. Um, that's a sharp man right there. I love that question. Uh, you know what? Mine's going to seem so trivial and so petty. Um, I don't even know if I, I want to use it as the example, but it, it's just resonating with me and it's just jumping out. Um, when I was really starting to get on at jamming and, you know, it was, it was just me and Roy. I mean, it was just the two of us for a, a while. Um, I really like I had the Boston clubs, right? Again, it was just, it was me or it was Chubb. That was it. So, uh, you know, and there were some other guys. Like, I got I don't. That was like that. diplomat. I, that was yeah, diplomat yeah, yeah, days, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I don't say that to say that there weren't other relevant DJs or there were a lot of great DJs, but it just seemed like me and Chubb were doing a lot of a lot of big stuff. But um, and I was and I was growing at Jam, and I had the launch pad was popping. Nas had just come by and done my show live. Like I was I was feeling myself. I was in it. And this is when the DJ crews were really starting to expand to get bigger. And so Flex obviously had been up with us doing, you know, he, he had come in and he was kind of, he came in once a month and he did the radio and then he went down and he did a club or whatever. And he was expanding the big dog, big dog pit bulls. And so he wanted to get somebody from each of the big stations in, in the city. So I was like, I'm a lock i'm definitely gonna be a big dog pit bull i knew all the people oh. over there i knew jay grand i knew joey i knew flex mm -hmm. i was good to go sure enough they named roy barboza the big dog pit bull i was so tight and ang i was oh my god i was so angry fast forward um i don't think i ever told the story but fast forward about two or three weeks later Hey, Slay hit me. And he was like, yo, Flex didn't make you a pit bull, huh? I was like, nah, man, shit's whack. And he was like, that's all good. He was like, I'm doing the street sweeper shit. You fit more of what I'm trying to do anyway. Do you want to join? And I did. And so Slay, so in a grand sweet street sweepers, it was probably like 10 of us in the country, right? Kind of like the second tier DJs. But what was amazing about that was at the time, Slade was kind of really starting to take over, 
not completely from Clue on the exclusives. Like Clue still would get a lot of the bigger, higher end stuff, but Slay was getting all of the street ammunition, like anything from the locks and from Mob and just like Slay was the guy they went to on Thursday nights for his show. And then Slay would just slide those to me for Sunday for the launch pad. And so I was breaking all of those records in boss. Like I was getting all those joints. And so for me, you know, look, what I love the men of Pitbull, absolutely. But I ended up being a street sweeper and Slay's still one of my close friends. And, you know, he was just feeding me joints and it was better for my show at the time, like where I was trying to really establish this kind of somewhere between Stretch and Bobito and, and what, um, and what Slay was doing with the street sweeper radio on Thursday nights. And it kind of just meshed it. So I know it sounds a little petty, but yeah, that, that was my beef. Now, those crews were a big thing, that's so I understand. It that. was, it was for a little while. Shay, for you, what, what what was the opportunity that you wanted, didn't get, and then realized that it was uh, good for you not to have gotten it? I don't know that it was good for me not to have gotten it, but um, Q-Tip had talked to me about being in the UMA. And what? The time, <laughs> and the, you know, Q-Tip, Dilla, Dilla was one of my favorite producers, so. Wow. And, it for and then it never really come into fruition I you know it was always like a miss you know what I mean and I and I know some of the reason why it was kind of like around the time right before I was transitioning into doing the executive thing so I think tip was probably watching like what is this guy really up to you know what I mean and I was already kind of on the path of doing the Warner Brothers thing so it got a little dice you know what I mean it got a little like how do I navigate you know what I mean so you know, that was mine because if, you know, if I could have been part of the UMA, you know, that, you know, could have gone, could have gone a different direction. Yeah. You know, life, you know, life would be a different thing right now. You know what I mean? Not to say that, you know, whatever, you know, in terms of, I'm not even talking about money. I'm talking about like my heroes in this game are like Mad Lib, you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. of like half that he went, you know what I mean? Still a Mad Lib. Those are the guys that I like. Oh, you know what I mean? Just, yeah, I just have so much respect of, they did it their way. <laughs> so, what are y'all listening to right now? Like, what are the things that the artists or the, or the music that you're getting super excited about? I know you do temperature check, so I'm I'm not yeah. talking about your temperature check, people. I'm talking about he's, he's all the folks in there. I'll say this, but one of my favorite artists that I listen to, and I know G's gonna shit all shit on this completely, but I listen to JPEG Mafia a lot. The kid out of Baltimore. Yeah, that's good. I like you. I get it. Okay. I get I, it. I, I thought yeah. you were gonna be like, oh, Peggy's too underground for me. I don't fucking. Nah, that. I get it. Um, not everybody fucks with Peggy. Yeah, no, nah, you know what, Greg? I'm still kind of all over the place, man. Like, obviously, I, I go to, um, you know, I, I have to. It's my job to kind of pay attention to what's going on in the mainstream. Obviously, mm-hmm. Griselda stuff is that's from our core in terms of you know the music that we like. I'm a West um, Side guy. Yeah, right. I mean, my um, yes. You know, it's funny, man. My daughter has become my kind of A and R in terms of like what the kids are listening to. So, I've, I, you know, she's, you know, little TJ and all these rappers that you put in front of me that I could not tell you who they were. Um, but she's actually been feeding me like a lot of good stuff. I thought the thing that Travis did the other night with Fortnite was amazing. I watched that for, mm-hmm. for the 15 minutes it was on and I was blown away and so proud a little bit, which was weird. Like I don't, I have no affiliation. I met Travis twice in my life. But I just thought it was such a moment for hip hop. Like, if if you haven't seen what he did on Fortnite the other night, like, I just kept thinking about. It. And I don't. And I think you you checked in the other night, Greg. I've been um on my IG lives. I, I've switched it up a little bit. I've been starting to mix videos instead of just records. And um, I did that because just kind of you know Instagram's such a visual thing right or just the visual entity that we're on now i'm like people don't want to sit there and watch me dj i was like let me give them something to look at but i say that to say to see what travis scott did with the Fortnite thing and the way that like hip-hop videos started it was amazing to me man i was like that was amazing so yeah yeah you know, honestly man i'm listening to a mix of everything you know um you know i still listen to my prince and michael and i listen to john coltrane I, you know i listen to the classics but i try to i try to stay up on the new stuff as much as possible as well I love what joint like again. I love what Joyner Lucas did with that Will Smith record. Amazing, I thought that was amazing. So, okay, that's it for me. Listen, man, I think I got, a, I got a massive record collection, so I still listen to like my vinyl. You know, I got turned everywhere. 
So I still listen to vinyl. But as far as the new stuff, I like the new play. Here's vinyl. my question, Che. How many how many keyboards do you have on your rig back there? It looks like I'm counting 12s. All right, listen, you just took that straight out of my head because I was about to ask. I mean, what do I got here? I got seven. I got nine in here. But I have I have a lot of keyboards. I probably have over 20, but I have nine in here that it's set up. Good God. Have, my. You probably have about... Chase always had gear. 12, 13 guitars. Yeah. Do you have your go-tos in terms of your, when you're doing your production? Like you, you always start off with this machine. I saw you it, pulled out, I saw you pulled out the ASR. I saw that on uh, yep. Instagram the other day. <laughs> That's an ASR chop right there. Yeah. Um, do I have a go-to? You know what? Honestly, it's about a mood thing, really. Um, mm -hmm. Because everything, everything gives you a different feeling. And now I'm at a point where, you know, I'm not making seven beats a day like I was with Dre. I'm not in the gym, like, meaning. I used to think about that as like, like kind of a boxer going to the, going to the, uh, you know, to work out and get in the ring before the actual event. So um, I'm not in it. I'm not sparring every day like that. So now for me is when I'm in here, it's kind of like, what, what do I gravitate to? messing around with and then that'll lead to what becomes the track so yesterday last night it was the move you know what i mean um but it varies um another night it was uh, a richard Pryor record i put on a richard Pryor record in the background i heard this little clip and that became the intro to my album mm -hmm. so and that led to okay we're starting this one with this richard Pryor record then i heard some then i heard some um then I heard, I played this Richard Bryan record. I didn't know what the record was going to sound like, but I heard bongos. So I grabbed the bongo. So I never know what's going to start a record and what it's going to be. You, know, you talked to be the MP. You talked about your album. Like, tell, tell us about that real quick before we get out of here. You, you didn't, I don't think I didn't hear that early on in the conversation that you just dropped the, you started your album. What was it yesterday? I did. Two days, well, two days ago, technically. Um, two okay. days ago when I found the Richard Pryor clip. And that's when I officially started the record because I found this clip. Um, I'm going to tell you guys now because, I, but it'll be interesting to see once it comes out, how many people get it. The album opens with this Richard Pryor clip and I'm using it as a metaphor about something. And I don't know how many people in the public will get it, but for you guys, I'm getting, I'm talking about the music industry. And if you know Mr. Pryor, if you know any of his clips, it's the it's the one where he's at the door going into the after hours. Mm. Oh, okay. So All he right. Knocks the door, he, he knocks at the door to go into the after hours, and I'm using it metaphorically for the music business. Okay, so. Dope. So tell us about this album. Is you you know, is it all your production? Is it gonna be yeah, just I'm a producer compilation type of thing or how, yeah, what kind of Dr. Yeah, Dr. Dre shit, just some compilation shit with a bunch of great artists. I mean, I have great artists from all over the world, from big names to no names. You know what I mean? So okay. you know, um definitely some major label artists. I you know, I'm not really worrying about artist clearances and all that. Hey, if the record's good enough that someone makes me cease and desist it. Then cool, that means someone's good enough to clear, pay for some samples and pay for some artist clearances. So I'm gonna put the shit out and I'm gonna make them come get me. You know, you I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna have some major label artists on it and I'm not, I'm not paying, you know, I'm not paying their label fees to clear them. So, because mm -hmm. I know one thing, once you put something in the world, it, it, it never, even if they take it down, it's never gone. Nah, it's out there, for sure. Out, you know, when are we, so, when can we look forward to? I mean, you just started working on it. Are you, Looking at a particular time to get it finished by, or what? It, what's your oh, schedule? My goal, my goal is thirty days, but I'm, I'll, I'll probably finish the music sooner than thirty days. It's really going to be on how quickly artists turn around the vocals because everyone's working remotely. So how quickly I send it to you know send it to somebody and they send it back, you know, um, it's really going to be you know up to them to really help determine it. And don't get me wrong, if someone takes too long, you know, I think but on I'm gonna to the next. Yeah, I'm. I'm same thing. They get you know. If I can't get this person and that person takes too long, or this person flakes, I want exactly like you said, on to the next. I'm not really gonna wait on people. It's really about who's who's down and who's willing to give it. I'm giving everybody seven days. You know, oh. they get they get it back to me in seven days. Cool. They don't. See what happens. 
Yeah, we have. So, listen, fellas, this has been an incredible talk. We definitely need to do a Boston edition of the uh, the, the temperature check. And we and my partner, Brandon, and I can curate that. We'll help you put that together, get some songs. I know G got some of the cut that we can yeah, pull up. I got some joints. Absolutely. Yeah. We might we might fuck around and go find T Max. Have a ah, my guy. I yeah, thought he was gonna he thought he might check in today. Yeah. He's still rapping. He's down Is he in, in, a, he's he's in Atlanta? Saying. Yeah. He's, he's in Atlanta, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Get him to, you know, we get him to pull up a 16. You know, there what you mean? go. I mean, but Che gave T Max some heat back in the days. I man, I gotta find that tape. We had some yeah, records, I, boy. I think I do. You, did you give me that? Because I know you gave me the new. Nah, I don't think. Joints. I don't, no, I don't you think gave anybody, me a team, I, you gave me a T Max project too. Yeah, no, nah, this is something else. else. Well, we, I always regret that we. That's we what we did it. We, we did a Rondor. Yeah, I'm mad that we never really got to really fully connect on it because that was my Boston Nas. You yeah. Know what I mean? Nah, we had records. We could have made a masterpiece, man. Yeah. His flow was so immaculate. Like, I listen, the good thing about being old is you get to see kind of the beginning and the end of, like, particularly when you're talking about the Boston stuff, like the early, early pieces and, and seeing what cats are doing today. And I remember his flow was just so mm -hmm. flawless. It was just, I, I tell grab you, what, you at the beginning I, of the a verse and just pull you all the way through. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find it. And Greg, we'll, uh, we'll put that on the, that other project we're doing on the, on the launch pad thing. That'll be, that'll be the next thing we do. Yes, sir. And then we, we, we listen, do that I, live. I, I, I've seen a lot of, I've been getting text messages and stuff like this. And now one, I got a text message from somebody who's like, okay, I want to be next. No one really asked you, but okay, we'll figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> and two, I got another one where people who are like, yo, you got to do this again. They love hearing both of you guys talk. They like us yeah. talking together. So we definitely have to do it again. Like I said, we do this Boston Boston temperature check. I think that'll be super dope. Yeah, that'll be dope. It's, it's, yeah. it's some heat in the cut that y'all haven't heard yet. I'm We're on the ground here, so we're, we're seeing some of it. Like, like yeah, I, I there's a, a lot of artists that I just think got really, really special stuff. So, you know, hey, well, thanks, for, thanks, yeah, thanks for having us, Greg. I know Che and I have been trying to do this for a while, so it was dope. Yo, yeah. man, listen, it's, it, we got to do it again sometime soon, man. And I appreciate you guys, you know, for being able to come to the table and share so much, man. The, the you giving your journey to everybody and, and kind of talking about those highs and lows. Hopefully, that can set the example for the people that are coming behind us, man. So that yeah. we appreciate that. Word. Stay yeah. safe, everybody. Stay Thank safe, you. You know what I mean? Yes, and, and, keep your, and keep your mind out. You know, it's one thing to keep your, your physical body active in, in your spirit, but also keep your mind. Keep your mind yeah, sharp. Absolutely. And yeah. thanks to all you guys for, for chiming in and being a part of this, man. You know. Yeah, and I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to going back and looking at the chat. It was kind of hard to follow along, but I saw Nelly Pro Tools and I saw Nav and, and uh, Sean, a couple of other people and Dre Rob pop in. So and, uh, thank you, all everybody, for coming through. Appreciate it. Oh yeah, we will be posting this on in the room. Young lady from Belgium's in the room. Okay. You know, we got some, you know, we got some of the international folks in here too. Nice. We're gonna be posting this on 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 all the platforms. It's gonna be on our you on the Killer Boom Box YouTube page. It'll be on the site. So you will if you missed any parts of it and you want to hear it, or if you want to share it with people, we will give you the opportunity to do that very, very soon. Gentlemen, again, thank you so much, man. We gotta do it again. Absolutely. Thanks, Greg. All right, man. Talk to you guys soon. Be well. Take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. You too, brother. Thank you. All right. Peace. That was super dope, man. That was super dope. All right, y'all. Party's done. We're out of here. Brandon, it's Miller time. <laughs> And or cannabis time, whatever you may prefer, my brother. We're out of uh, here. Uh, black bottles. Uh, well, listen, we do that too. I need a couple of those. Got you, got you. Yeah, I'm about to hit this end button. Listen, y'all, thank you so much for rocking with us. And we will see you again with another edition of Conversations with G. This is the first of many. <laughs>